This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. First order, I will um, sing a presence of a quorum of the Amherst School Committee. I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.32 p.m. And we'll start with a roll call attendance. Um, Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, present. Mr. Demling. Demling, present. Ms. Lord. Lord, present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, present. And McDonald, present. I'll turn it over to the Pelham chair. All right, thank you. Seeing a presence of a quorum of the Pelham School Committee, I'll call the Pelham School Committee to order and we'll do a uh, roll call. Mr. Menino. Oh, you're on mute, Ron. Menino present. Great. Ms. Stancer. Stancer present. Ms. Kenny. Kenny present. And Hall present. And um, seeing a presence of a, quorum, of a quorum of the region school committee, I call that meeting to order. Um, and we'll start with roll call there as well. Um, Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. Ms. Lord. Lord present. Mr. Demling. Demling present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Stancer. Stancer present. Mr. Menino. Menino present. Uh, Mr. Sullivan. Uh, not here yet. So, uh, and McDonald present. Oh, Ms. Peter, sorry. I, I was writing your name as I was going through, so I wouldn't forget people this time. Ms. Seeger. Seeger present. Right. So we are now uh, in session. Um, so thank you again to um, Amherst Media for uh, broadcasting. We are um, streaming on, live on Channel 15 in Amherst and also online um, uh, through Amherst Media. And this meeting is being recorded. Um, so our first uh, item is to approve our minutes from uh, June 25th from our joint meeting then. Were there any uh, changes, edits? Ms. Kenny? So I just saw two things I had questions about. On page 13, near like halfway down, it said the Snell test. I think it maybe should have been the smell test with an M. And then um, in the last paragraph, it talks about uh, Jesse saying something about keeping the three feet distance, but I'm pretty sure she said wanting to keep a six foot distance. So those are just two typo looking things I, I noticed. Great. Thank you. Anything else that people noticed? Not seeing any. Would anybody like to make a motion? Mr. Demling. I move to approve the minutes of June 25th, 2020 for the Amherst School Committee. Lord second. Moved by Demling, seconded by Lord. So this is for the Amherst School Committee. Um, Ms. Lord. Aye. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. So minutes are approved five to zero. Mr. Demling. That was so much fun. I'll do it again. I move to approve the minutes of June 25th, 2020 for the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee. Lord second. Um, moved by Demling, seconded by Lord. Uh, Miss Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Stancer. 
Stancer, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. And McDonald, aye. Uh, the uh, motion passes eight, zero, and one absent. Ms. Hall. Thank you. Is there a motion from the Pelham School Committee for the minute? I move that we accept the minutes of the school committee from June 25th, 2020. Second the motion. Great. All right. Uh, roll call vote. All right, Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. And Hall, aye. Thanks. Great. So uh, next up is a public comment, and we have um, a lot of public comment. We have two um, voice messages, recordings, and, um, and then also a document um, with uh, several email comments. Um, and just as a reminder, people, um, we welcome public comment. We welcome comment at any time to the school committee at arps.org email address. Um, and uh, public comment specific to meetings may be submitted by 3 p.m. on the day of the meeting. Um, so I will begin by playing the audio um, before we go into the, the printed ones. I am Jeff Lee, a resident of Amherst, and I would like to comment on what I see as a shortcoming of the recent Family Distance Learning Survey. The survey explores how the community feels about various aspects of online learning but it does not ask respondents how we feel about the prospect feeling safe in the fall. Most would agree that under normal conditions, in-class instruction is superior to virtual instruction, and the survey offered ample opportunity for families to express dissatisfaction with distance learning. However, frustration with distance learning should not be confused with optimism about safely sending our children to school in the coming year. Indeed, survey was announced three weeks ago, COVID-19 cases in the United States have increased 36%. Infections are currently on the rise in all but nine states. I have become much less confident in a successful school reopening than I was when I completed the survey. I believe that the district should focus a considerable amount of its resources on developing a high quality distance learning program for the coming academic year. This will require training teachers, providing extensive technical support, and investing in new equipment, but it will present a contingency in case the pandemic flares up in the fall and an option for families who feel unsafe and unready to send their students to school. Thank you. And the second voice message. Hello, my name is Carol Gray. and. I'm making a public comment. I'm a parent of a 10th grader at the Amherst Regional High School. I'm calling to urge you to create a robust online program for the fall. I think we may need to be 100% online. Personally, I don't feel comfortable having my child go to um, a public school right now when uh, the death toll and the COVID cases are still on the rise. Just this morning, the news reported that 41 cases were experiencing a rise in COVID cases. 14 states had single day highs. Dr. Fauci said that with the opening up nationwide, this is a quote, he says, we're within a period of a, within a period of a week and a half, we've almost doubled the number of cases nationwide. This is not the time to go to in-person classes. If you do, feel it's the only thing that you're going to try. I hope that you will at least create an online program that can be implemented immediately when cases start to arise. Uh, this has been done in other countries and in Israel, what happened when they reopened the schools, within a couple of weeks they had to shut down because they had uh, more than 100 cases uh, developing in one school. Um, actually, they had 130 cases in a single school, uh, so they had to shut down the schools again. One doctor in Israel said he wasn't surprised by this because this is also what happened in, in South Korea and Singapore. So 
the spikes because of opening up public schools are, are very real, and we have to have an online program that we can immediately kick into if we have to shut the schools down. Denmark is the model to look to if you are planning to have a reopening. Uh, and what they did was they first sent back uh, the youngest group of students. Uh, I'm reading all this from a Brookings Institute article that uh, was just published yesterday online. And in Denmark, they sent back grades 0 through 5. Uh, on April 15th, Finland did the same thing. They sent back grades one through nine on May 1st. And then in Denmark, they later sent the secondary school students grades six through 10. They are a more vulnerable group. Um, what there's not data about is how much are young people, even if they're young children, how much are they spreaders of the disease transmitting it, even if they're not coming down with symptoms as much as adults. Um, the other things that Denmark did is they had students were required to wash hands every two hours. Uh, they were seated 6.5 feet apart. I know you're already doing that. Uh, educational materials and equipment had to be cleaned twice daily. Additional sinks and toilets were installed. Parents dropped off students at staggered times and at different school entrances. Parents were not allowed into the building. And parents and children with symptoms were not allowed to attend school. Uh, they also used community buildings, libraries, um, hotels, conference centers, banks were used for schools. Denmark also gave parents the option of keeping their children home if they did not feel it was safe. Sorry, that wasn't me. Google Voice actually um, does end at a um, maximum of three minutes um, for uh, the voice message. Um, so Dr. Morris, are you able to share the screen with the, with the email comments we've received?
So I just want to note that I'm getting some text that people who are watching the stream are, are having a harder time seeing the letters. Or it's not, it's a little blurry. Um, I, I don't know if it's coming up blurry to anyone on the, um, who's on the call. I don't know if it's a connection with Amherst Media, um, but I just want to pause here because I'm getting some text from folks. I don't know if, you know, Ms. McDonald and Ms. Hall, are you seeing it clearly? Yeah, yeah, I can see it fine. Okay, and and this will be part of the minutes, um, and and we could figure out if I can somehow get it to Amherst Media. I don't know if there's a way to to change it, but um, it it certainly looks clear on my screen, and so um, I don't think there's anything I do to make it more clear. I think it must be somehow the connection to Amherst Media. I think so as well. I'm I'm streaming both, and on my Zoom I see it clearly, or Google Meets, but on the stream it's blurry. Okay. And so um, I'm now getting lots of texts. Um, and so some of them are indicating on channel 15, it's coming up clearly, but on the live stream, it's blurry. Um, so, and Faith Framers Media is saying that she can't, she's trying, but she can't make it any clearer. So I don't know yeah. how, uh, what, I wanna pause and give the chairs an opportunity for, um, I wanna pause and then yeah. I'll do whatever you all want. Um, I'm, I'm hearing that as well, that on TV, um, on the, on channel 15, it is clear. Um, but on the screen. Just said it got better. It just got better. Who's streaming it. I don't know if that's accurate or not. Um, I didn't do anything different. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm getting multiple people telling me it's clear now. Mr. Demley. Yeah. So if that's the case. Great. Um, I would suggest then um, we should probably invest the time and just re rerunning the comments that we've already run out of respect to the people that submitted the written comments. I yep. agree. Sure. So I'll go to the top and I'm getting multiple people telling me it's clear now. So hopefully uh, who are on the stream. So whatever Faith did, thank you, Faith Amherst Media. You're wonderful. And uh, <laughs> we'll try to scroll down. Yeah, a lot of people saying it improved a minute ago, whatever happened. Sorry, I was muted. So now I'm getting people telling me it's getting blurry again. Just to clarify, I'm not doing anything different. Um, I'm just trying to scroll down. So um, I'll just pause again for the school committee. Mr. Demling. So Dr. Mars, are you able to you know, like double the size of the font? Mm -hmm. um, uh, double would probably put it off the screen, but I'm able to increase it. Okay, significantly increase such that Possibly the blurriness will be less. Uh, I think it's it's sort of as big as it can be. I don't think it's the size. It's more the blurriness is what people are texting me. Um, yeah. I'm also just happy to read them if people would prefer that. Or I'll take turns if someone wants to do that. <laughs> I'm also just happy to read. Um, read it. Read it. Let's, why don't we uh, read? And if we have, um, oh, uh, and Ciela is offering to take turns as well. Oh, that's very sweet. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, I'll read until it feels like um, um, getting uh, tired of reading, and then someone else can take over. Thank you, Ciela, for offering. So, a first public comment as we think about uh, how to begin the new school year while still in the midst of a pandemic, I'd like to offer a few 
comments drawing on my experiences as a clinical psychologist. We should begin by thinking hard about what all kids need, whatever the circumstances. Children need two things above all else. They need to feel as safe as reasonably possible, both physically and psychologically. They also need an educational setting that gives them some structure and limits. I'm going to pause because actually someone should be timing these at the three minutes because otherwise that would unfairly benefit people who wrote comments versus people who typed out comments. And I did not think of it before I started. Um, I'd be happy but, to do uh, that. Yeah. So if someone could uh, be the timer and tell me when to stop, um, I feel like that's equitable. Um, yep. If that's okay. I will do that. I'm starting it now. Okay. I forgot where I was. I'm going to start at the beginning. Sorry. Uh, it's a long-winded one. As we, For me, um, as we think about how to begin the new school year while still in the midst of a pandemic, I'd like to offer a few comments drawing on my experiences as a clinical psychologist. We should begin by thinking hard about what all kids need, whatever the circumstances. Children need two things above all else. They need to feel as safe as reasonably possible, both physically and psychologically. They also need an educational setting that gives them some structure and limits. We can never guarantee complete safety, but COVID-19 poses unusual challenges. Moreover, although children and adolescents thrive with some structure and limit setting, indeed they require it, the requirements of social distancing and face masks require more than the usual effort to establish and maintain limits and may cause some low-level anxiety among students that surpass, surpasses ordinary levels. In fact, we should be alert to the possibility suggested by clinical observation that some children and adolescents with higher levels of anxiety even before the coronavirus may actually do better with remote learning done primarily from home. I've seen this in my own adolescent practice, as have colleagues to whom I've spoken. We may worry that they will lose the benefits of social interaction, but when those interactions come with unprecedented levels of anxiety, there may be no benefit at all, at least in the short term. That said, my practice constantly reminds me that children are, by and large, remarkably resilient and do have capacity to adapt to difficult and unusual circumstances. Yet again, their resilience is not a sufficient substitute for careful planning and education about what they will be expected to do. Everyone has to work together in this process, teachers, administrators, guardians, the community, as well as the students. My clinical practice suggests that flexibility and creativity are especially important in moments like this. Our conventional assumptions about class time and structure are not now a reliable guide. Traditional classroom activities five days a week is not a magical standard, especially for adolescents. That is essential to enforce regardless of circumstances. Finally, I think planning should occur, I think planning should consider the advantages of making relatively modest changes that can be altered as we go. Dramatic off and on changes can be particularly stressful for everyone. So we try to do our best and to avoid moving back and forth between full reopening and fully closing. Thank you for all your incredibly hard work in this difficult time and your ongoing dedication to staff, teachers and students, Catherine Oppi, D. Amherst. Okay, we'll go on to the next one. I'll do a couple and then maybe someone else can jump in. Um, and I apologize if my intonation's off. I'm just trying to get through them under three minutes and they're not my words. <laughs> uh, I'm doing the best I can, but I apologize in advance because um, I'm probably making mistakes. I'm happy to take a turn too so that your uh, you don't get, voice doesn't get too strange. All right, I'll do three and then I'll probably need a break. Um, hello, thanks to the school board for all of its work on developing reopening plans. I know you are in uncharted territory and appreciate the time the committee is taking to think th this through in so many levels. I'm a parent of two ARPS children and the wife of an ARPS teacher, so I definitely have concerns about reopening across several levels. I'm also a college professor and have deep concerns about college students returning. There are a couple of things I'd like to comment on given my positions. I'm in the unique situation. I have a younger child in lower elementary and a child about to enter middle school. We are lucky to come from a well-resourced home. Both my partner and I have maintained our jobs. But after doing 3.5 months of online learning with both my children, I would like the committee to think about the youngest in our community. On a personal level, my six-year-old has had major regression as a result of the spring emergency closing. He has regressed in his behavior, emotions, and certainly his academics. I have deep concerns that if my child, who comes from a well-resourced home with parents who are able to provide academic, social, and emotional support, had such a difficult time, then I deeply worry about parents who must leave the home to work, who are themselves under resource and who are unable to provide for their children the time necessary to support them with online learning. On the other hand, my 12-year-old has flourished. She was able to easily navigate online content. She developed innovative ways to socialize with her friends. She took on baking and cooking projects and developed her own sense of social justice. The fact that she could already read and be somewhat self-directed was significant. While having all children in school as much as possible would ideal and something the district should work towards, toward, 
I want to make the case for doing whatever is possible to keep the lower elementary grades in school full time. Although I worry about my partner teaching so many children being exposed to the virus, I think if we're going to risk opening schools, uh, we need to prioritize the most vulnerable children and put the youngest in full-time school. I also hope that the school board is in communication with the chancellor at UMass. I'm not sure if this is possible, but I'd like to see UMass develop social programming for returning students to keep them on campus as much as possible. My biggest worry is the spread of the virus will come from college students. If the committee can ask the rest of the Amherst area to community to prioritize K-12 education, that would be awesome. Thanks for your time. Best, Rebecca Dingo, Amherst. All right, so uh, if I do one more, maybe I'll turn it over um, to Ms. McDonald. And I think you have this document so um, as well, Ms. McDonald. So we, the members of the Amherst Pelham Education Association, stand in strong opposition to returning to in-person learning in the fall of 2020. We call on the district to work together with us without further delay on improving, refining, and setting standards for distance learning. As educators in the Amherst Pelham Regional Public Schools, we care deeply about the safety and well-being of our students, as well as the quality of what we provide, um, of quality of the education we provide, excuse me. The educators of the Amherst Pelham Regional Schools have shown for decades they hold the interest of students and their success and the successes, success of the school system as their first priority. Students First Ethos compels ARPS educators to go above and beyond in their efforts to elevate the opportunities for student success. They commit to these goals knowing that achieving them often means working long into the evening, sacrificing time with family, and ignoring self-care and personal health needs. They do this out of a vocation to teaching. We ask them to ask them to put their lives and those of their family members on the line for the sake of reopening is to ask too much. The APEA cannot support any plan that puts its members at such serious risk until medical science fully reassures the public of the utmost safety from the deadly disease of, disease of COVID-19. In light of the current rise of COVID-19 cases throughout much of the country, directly caused by the premature reopening of communities, our members feel it's unsafe for students or teachers or staff to return to classrooms. Specifically, the following are our grave concerns. Staff traveling between multiple buildings, related service providers, teachers, and paraeducators do not feel safe. The lack of district provided PPE for students and staff, untenable and unsustainable scenarios for compliance with PPE distancing guidelines, puts the physical and mental health of students, staff, and administrators at risk. Teachers cannot be tasked with policing students' bodies and behaviors as opposed to being educators who connect with students and cultivate a love of learning. Staff who are vulnerable or who families are vulnerable to COVID-19, the clearly documented disproportionate dangers to people of color from COVID-19 stemming from and furthering racial injustice, Environmental concerns loom large, such as school buildings with poor ventilations, rooms without windows. The DESE guidelines ignore the science behind coronavirus transmission and spread. The CDC contradicts itself by citing requirements to open in a truly safe manner that do not account for the physical and economic limitations that this district and those across the country face on one hand, and declaring that students need to return to school for their own well-being on the other. To conclude, the coronavirus continues to spread rapidly through the United States. The only true safe option is to plan for improving distance learning and use the remainder of the summer and early September to strengthen and implement those improvements. We have the tools to remain socially and therefore educationally engaged. To reopen in any other capacity, especially in a college town with the likelihood of closing again due to a surge in the first wave or second wave infection rates, ignores the reality that without testing, contract tracing, proven antibody therapies, the risk level for the entire community is too large. Respected members of the school committees and respected members of our district, we request that you do not allow us any excuse to justify the risk that may threaten the health or life of even one person to, as together we fight COVID-19. Let us continue to live, to teach, and to learn in the safest way possible remotely. Mick O'Connor, APA President and APA Executive Board. And if uh, someone's able to give me a, uh, at least a little break, um, that would be great. Okay, uh, CLO is um, offering to take over. Thank you, Sheila. No problem. Um, can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Okay. My name is Mylene Rodriguez Scott, and I've been a resident in Amherst for the past 23 years. My K-12 schooling was through the ARP system, and my younger brother is entering eighth grade at Amherst Regional Middle School. I am writing to you today to express my concern if ARPs were to reopen this fall. Although in-person education is crucial to our students' development, I believe that reopening the schools this fall would pose too large of a health risk to our students, the staff in the schools, and the family members of those students and staff. I do not think ARPS could maintain social distancing protocol for our students, not due to a lack of effort from the teachers and staff, but simply because expecting our students to maintain a six-foot distance and to wear masks for the entire school day is unrealistic. 
nor do I think an adjusted school schedule with rotating in-person and virtual classes will keep our students and members safe. Ultimately, the safest option that can be made is to continue virtual learning until we have a vaccine against COVID-19. UMass's decision to invite students back to campus this August and the travel season also put our community at a higher risk. So I ask that the school committee help reduce the overall risk in Amherst by supporting a plan to keep our schools closed until it is safe to reopen. Thank you for your time. Maylene Rodriguez Scott of Amherst. Dear Chair Allison McDonald and members of the Amherst Pelham and Amherst Pelham Regional School Committees, many of us have stated our commitment or recommitment to non-negotiables, including the health and safety of the students of our school districts, the staff, and all of our families, the whole well-being of our students, including their physical and social, social emotional well-being, the urgency in rethinking our institutions and practices with a critical anti-racism approach, to center the experiences and histories of black and brown students in our communities in order to rebuild an education system that benefits all of our students through learning to be actively anti-racist. I have seen our district's commitments mentioned or echoed in many other guidance for venues, including Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and the American Academy of Pediatrics. But what I have not heard from our school committees, Mass DESE or the AAP is a proposal that integrates these three commitments. We, our community, and the global scientific community know that know what we don't know. We don't know how to stop the spread of a deadly virus that is currently present in our communities using the materials that we currently have unavailable. We also know that BIPOC, which stands for Black, Indigenous, People of Color communities, are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. If we are to truly center anti-racism and safety, None of us can be willing to design and implement a medical and public health experiment that we know will hurt some members of our school communities and disproportionately hurt our BIPOC communities. By implementing six foot social distancing versus three foot in order to curb transmission is not acceptable. We cannot bring our children into our buildings until we know that we will not be putting them and their families at risk for death, infection, or growing scientific acknowledgement of long-term effects post COVID infection. Medical history in the United States is laden with experimenting on black and brown bodies. We cannot add to this history. You, the school committees, have the power to bring our educators together to plan for and implement safe educational practices to get better at what we've started, to do not accept anything that may physically harm our students, staff, or our families. As an institution, the school committees can join with our unions, forward-thinking school districts, and as many state governments that we can muster to demand government support services that our families need to be safe, to stay home while we figure out how to be safe in schools and to not be a dangerous medical experiment. Signed humbly and urgently, Lonnie Fletchman. P.S. I write to you to express my personal views. I'm also grateful and proud to be the Fort River Librarian and the APEA Unit A Co-Chair of Elementary. Good afternoon. Well, I, think I can. You want to do one more? I can. I'm feeling recovered, uh, Cielo. But <laughs> Do one more. Okay, I'll do one more. Okay. Good afternoon, Chair McDonald. I'm writing to express my concern about the potential reopening of ARPS in the fall. My name is Daria Karinchevsky Lipset, and I am a graduate of UMass Amherst and a resident of the town of Amherst. I was dismayed to see that my alma mater's decision to invite students back to campus for in person learning in August, a decision putting not only students and staff at the university in danger, but posing a risk to our entire community. While I am a lover of education and a big believer that virtual learning will never be able to replace the value of in-person schooling, I strongly believe that's the safest choice for everyone in our community is to continue virtual learning until we have a vaccine or ad adequate contact tracing. Thank you for your time. Daria Kuroshi Lipset of Amherst. Thank you very much, Cielo. I can try to take over. There's, there's a few more, but hopefully I get through them. My name is Lamiko McGee, and I'm a special education teacher at the middle school. I'm deeply concerned about the possibility that our schools are considering in-person learning as an option while we still battle the COVID-19 virus with thousands of people dying every day. There is no way to open schools safely, and I humbly request you consider remote learning as the only option until science have declared, scientists excuse me, have declared that the virus is no longer a threat to our health, even our very lives. As a teacher in the middle school, I know my students, even trying their best on their best behavior, will not be able to adhere to guidelines necessary to prevent the spread of this deadly virus. Many of us students and staff are older, have health conditions that put our lives at grave risk. Many of us students and staff have elderly parents at home or those with compromised immune systems. 
To bring this virus home to loved ones, it will likely be fatal. Please make the right decision. Thank you, Lamiko T. T McGee. MED, JD, Special Education Department lead, Amherst Regional Public Schools. Um, I support the APEA statement on the plans to return to school in person this fall. I dearly miss my students and think that in-person learning is superior to remote learning. However, we do not have control of this virus and returning to school in person will put us all at risk only to close again after we start. I think we can spend this time planning for better remote learning, connecting with families now and helping them to set up plans for fall. If we plan for remote now, instead of putting hundreds of thousands of dollars into returning to school, only to be closing abruptly again after the virus spreads. Shari Conklin, teacher at ARPS. It seems the big concern people have about distance learning, it isn't fair to all the students and their families, but try to get back to normal during a pandemic doesn't actually solve the problem of inequality and could even make things worse. If we really want to address fairness in our society. We need to take the effort being spent trying to tape things back together and use it to instead to build something new. Aaron Jensen Amherst. Dear Allison, I completely fully support the APA statement regarding remote only learning this fall. While I love teaching with all my heart and miss my students terribly, I feel that remote learning best supports health and safety for everyone. Thank you, Kate Perkins, third grade teacher, Crocker Farm School. My name is Alicia Walker and I live in Amherst. I'm the parent of three young black children in the Amherst Regional Public School System. I'm also part of the 1% of teen moms who earn a four-year degree by the age of 30 and as alum of UMass Amherst. I currently work in the criminal justice system advocating for anti-racist policies. I'm advocating for Amherst to also implement anti-racist policies within the school district. Incredibly disappointed in the district's ability to engage families of color in COVID recovery. We know that students of color have and continue to bear the burden of a broken educational system and their voices must be centered in the town's recovery plan. Families of color are also experts in their children and needs and their voices must be strategically amplified. When considering the priorities for, fall, for the fall, I demand that the district focuses on developing task force, forces, excuse me, or working groups that include and compensate educators, families, students, and community members of color for their work and apply that information to COVID recovery and planning immediately and without question. Thank you, Alicia Walker Amherst. I apologize, I do not have too much time to write since I'm at work, but I'm the mother of a soon to be eighth grader. I do not feel it's safe to reopen schools. I would not feel comfortable sending him physically into the school building. Thank you for your time, Jennifer Scott Amherst. And I think that's it. Thank you, CeeLo, I needed that break. <laughs> Great, Th thank you um, both for, for reading the, the comments. Um, that, was, that was super helpful. Um, we're, always, we're always flexing with our technical <laughs> challenges in this, in this virtual environment. Um, so I just, we don't usually comment, but I just, on, on public comment, but I will just call to attention that many of the comments that people made in these, in these public comments get at um, items that are um, in our agenda this evening. So we will be actually circling back and coming and talking specifically to some of those exact topics that people raised in, in their public comments. So um, stay tuned. Um, and we also, um, just as a reminder for everybody who's watching at home, we also have uh, two town halls planned on Thursday, one at noon that's primarily focused on elementary schools and one um, at five that's primarily focused on um, our secondary schools. So there's um, more opportunity to share feedback and ask questions. Um, I will, uh, Mr. Menino. How does the public access those forums? The um, great question. Uh, there, there is a flyer um, that is in tonight's packet. Um, it was also, it's also posted on the arps.org website. Um, and for those that use um, social media, it's um, posted on um, not just the arps uh, social, uh, Facebook page, but also several PGOs have shared it. Several school committee members have shared it. Um, so it's a, it's a YouTube live stream. Um, so another uh, route is just to go straight to YouTube and search for it at, um, at 12 o'clock or 5 o'clock. And it's also been emailed, you may have said this, but it's emailed out to all staff and all families, uh, I think on the end of last week. I can't remember which day. Great. Thank you. Um, so next up, we have um, superintendent's update. Sure. So um, I'll try to be brief because I know we have a long agenda. Um, so. Um, skipping around a bit. So one of the nice things is this uh, past week, we were able to send out um, class of 2033 t-shirts to our incoming kindergarten students. Um, and I got some nice feedback that they were well received and um, 
some of them wore them multiple days in a row, and that was created a little bit of problem in some people's houses. But it was uh, it was a nice thing, and thanks to Shasha Figueroa who really organized that uh, and got those out to our incoming kindergarten families. Um, it was brought to the district's attention the last week that one of our staff members posted information on social media that's causing some concerns in the community. And I just want to say the district doesn't support these views or comments. Um, it was done on a private page. We are currently investigating the matter. We're also considering our social media policies for staff more generally. Um, and so we'll have more on that soon, but um, you know, Human Resources has taken the lead on investigating that and, and we want to be more clear with our staff and set uh, more clear expectations of social media usage um, when not in the building. Uh, this summer, uh, we have lined up uh, the Bright folks. For, for the, those who don't know, Bright's a program in our middle school and high school, started in our high school a couple years ago, several years ago. Um, they're experts in mental health and they're running some uh, workshops on how to support students given the closure, given the pandemic. So we're gonna be working with them in early August with the administrative team and then turning that to our staff because we know how important the mental health needs of students um, are right now and we wanna be prepared for that the fall. Uh, summer school started yesterday. Um, we talked about the, all the summer school programs that we had. Uh, what's needed is sort of becoming a laboratory for new ideas around distance learning. We know our teachers are doing some excellent, um, trying out new things uh, in different formats. And we've got some positive feedback on that, uh, even though it just started yesterday. Uh, on that note, our Elementary Achievement Academy has, this year we're having a, a different program with a library and a film festival. So that's our Title I and ELL program. Um, so we're trying again to provide some enrichment activities as well as the academic content that students maybe need to be um, maintaining. And uh, in addition for our summer programs, there's been videos for families set up on wi how to connect to Wi-Fi and mobile hotspots, connecting to devices, and that's all been done in English and Spanish because we're trying to continue to support families uh, around the technology divide. It's one thing to support families with devices, another thing to make sure they have uh, all they need to get uh, on board. And because we have so much other stuff on the agenda, I think I'll leave it there for this evening. Thank you. Are there any um, questions um, from any of the committees? Mr. Sullivan, and welcome. <laughs> I think you're muted, Steve. You're, we still can't hear you. Do you want to, uh, you, could, oh, you probably can't type it in chat either. No. <laughs> okay. Hopefully, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to hear you at uh, a later point. Any other, any, does anybody else have questions or comments? I'm seeing none. Let's go. Okay. Great. Um, chair's update. Uh, I've already previewed my update, which is our town halls on on um, on Thursday. So I won't uh, spend any more time because we have a lot to cover tonight. Um, are there any announcements from uh, school committee members? Mr. Denley. Yeah, I just wanted to give everyone a brief update on the resolution that we passed a few weeks ago. Uh, calling on the state to guarantee uh, every school district full reimbursement for whatever COVID-19 expenses um, we incur following state mandates, whether it's remote or in-person, whatever the model is. Um, so since that point, um, 128 school committees across the state have, have passed the resolution and it's, it's starting to get some attention. And I wanted to um, give a special thank you to our state representatives. So Senator Comerford, Representative Dome and Representative Blay, the three state representatives who represent all our towns in our three districts, um, sent a letter to Governor Baker, uh, Education Secretary Jim Pizer, and Education Commissioner Jeff Riley, along with uh, five of their other colleagues, uh, strongly supporting our resolution and urging a timely response, um, which is exactly what, what's going to need to happen in order for this to get done. We're going to need a host of state representatives from across uh, the Commonwealth um, ur urging that this get done. So this was this was really great. So I wanted to thank them for their participation as well as their colleagues, um, State Senator Adam Hines, uh, as well as Representatives uh, Sabadosa, Kerry, Mark, and and Whips um, joined joined in that letter as well. So 
hopefully that leads to something, but um, it, it was great to see that level of uh, timely advocacy. Ms. Lord. I would like to um, announce to the public that next Wednesday, July 15th, there will be a school equity task force meeting at seven o'clock. The information will be posted on our website and I welcome you all to join us. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any other announcements? Seeing none. Um, great, then we will move on to um, our new and continuing business. And our first item is the distance learning survey results. Sure, so uh, I'll bring that up and, and share that. And um, Obed is here, so thank you, Obed. He worked with me again on um, this survey. Uh, he's becoming an expert at it. So uh, we have a long agenda, So, and I know it's you know in the packet and people were able to see it before. So we're gonna try to summarize the high high points. We're not gonna read through every single data on a 23 slide uh, presentation and then open it up for conversation throughout. Um, once I open it up, I won't be able to see you. So I'll just look for audio, uh, recognition that people could see it and then also miss mcdonald um if you could let me know if there are questions throughout because i won't be able to see them sure thing so let me bring that up Oops. okay is that visible for folks yes okay sounds good um so we again wanted to start i'll, I'll do a little introduction i'll turn it over to obed but we again uh, did find Mass Inc. did a uh, poll um, a little before ours, so, uh, but at the, towards the end of the school year. And the question we thought was particularly relevant was um, parents of, the question was the percentage of parents who said they give a great deal or a fair amount of assistance with, you know, the, the darker bars, the purplish magenta bars are technology and the pink hue is schoolwork. And, and its short story is what you see is that the younger the students are, um, the more involved the parents um, had to be for students to be successful. And then it's sort of, when you got to high school, um, it's pretty even across the grade levels, but you could see, you know, with the primary grades to the middle, to the intermediate grades, to middle school, um, you could see that trend line is really clear. So I think the, the thing I wanna note is on the left, you can see the averages and, um, you know, there, there's sort of extremes that the younger students and the older students don't really fit the averages. Um, and the short story is we saw a similar trend here. Um, so I'll, I'll go through this slide and then probably turn it over to, to Obed, which is uh, one of the questions asked, how independently can your student complete remote learning activities and assignments? And the red is to need help for each activity and the blue is need help for most activities. You can see elementary school parents, um, well, you know, over 50% were in one of those two categories. Whereas at the middle school, that was down to 16%. And at the high school, that was down to 11%. So we are seeing uh, that same trend that it was in the statewide data uh, we saw in terms of our distance learning plan um, in the spring. Um, Obed, do you wanna go over this one as well? Um, do you wanna pick up from the assignments on the right level of rigor or you want me to go for a little further? Sure, that, that sounds good. Okay. All right, so I'm just gonna pick up where Dr. Morris left off. Um, this this question, as you see, is asking about the level of rigor for the assignments that students received. And this graph is showing parents' responses across grade levels, so element, elementary, middle school, and high school. So as you can see, on average, across all grade levels, 57% of parents expressed that the rigor that their children, the rigor of the assignments that for the assignments that their children received, they were not challenging enough, whereas 30% expressed that uh, the level of rigor was just right, and 13 expressed that it was either too rigorous or somewhat too rigorous. If we go on to student responses for the same question about this next slide, yeah, there you go. About 60% of students um, ex expressed that the level of rigor was just right, whereas 16% expressed that it was either too much or somewhat too much, it was either too much or somewhat too much, and another 24% uh, indicated that the level of rigor was too little. And in addition to that, uh, another question that was asked was trying to assess how parents felt about the level of personal collect connection that students were having with their teachers and other peers during this model. Here, um, again, across grade levels, about 78% of parents indicated that their children were 
either too disconnected or somewhat disconnected during this online learning model. 20% indicated that the level of connection. Yes, question? Yes, there's a question, Mr. Menino. What does disconnected mean? So I can answer that one. Um, so I think what the question was trying to get at is disconnected from both their peers and from their teacher and from the education experience. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the things that we heard anecdotal feedback about throughout this spring. Um, and I think you'll see that the student and the family responses and the staff responses actually line up with some similar trends. But we were hearing that uh, anecdotally from a lot of people. So we wanted to follow up about whether that, again, that personal connection was adequate. Um, so, you know, for me, if it's disconnected, it means the personal connection wasn't adequate. If there was, you know, if it was the right amount or even too connected, uh, that would that would get at that personal connection, which we know is so important for all of our students and particularly for our students who um, really require that to access their learning. Thank you. Ms. Spitzer. So just one, well, excuse me, clarifying question. When you say student responses, I'm assuming you're, you didn't survey the kindergartners. So could you just clarify which um, grade levels you... you yeah, I should have mentioned that at the beginning. So when, it, when it says student response, it's, it's, we only ask middle school and high school students. So we don't have elementary, school, stu, elementary student responses. Uh, we have elementary family responses, elementary uh, staff, faculty, family, but not um, student responses. But so when it's students, it's exclusively looking at the middle school, high school. Um, I can pick up. Uh, so yeah, so 78%, as I said, of parents indicated that their child was either too disconnected or somewhat disconnected. 20% saying that the the amount of connection was just right. And a small amount, 2% expressed that there was too much connection. So when we go to student responses, again, this is middle school and high school, about 57% of the students in the survey indicated that there was either that they were either, that they felt too disconnected um, or somewhat disconnected from their teachers and other peers in this online model. 40% indicated that the level of connection was just right, it was adequate. And about uh, a smaller percent indicated that there was too much connection. As far as staff, the, the staff had a similar response to parents in the sense that staff also indicated that there was not enough personal, personal connection so about 82% of staff expressed that the level of personal connection was either too much or somewhat too, uh, too disconnected. 17 saying that it was just right and less than one saying that there was too much. Um, in addition to this question, parents, staff, and students were also asked to uh, indicate how manageable the time was that they had to dedicate to re uh, remote learning purposes. So this, is, uh, this slide is talking about the family responses, about 50, 53% of parents in a survey said that the time dedicated to remote learning was either manageable or easily manageable. Um, another third expressed that the time was barely manageable. So there may have been some challenges, but they were still able to do it. And 14% just 14 of parents in a survey said that the time dedicated to remote learning purposes was just not manageable at all. When we move on to staff, um, there's a similar response um, in terms of the time being manageable, um, based on 226 responses, this uh, we according to the surveys, staff spent about five and a half hours um, daily on remote learning purposes. And when they were asked to indicate how manageable that was, about 62% indicated that it was either manageable or easily manageable. Um, 36 said that it was barely manageable and 2% said that it was not manageable. Um, when we asked students the same question, um, uh, when we asked students the same question, it was important to, yeah, that's right. Okay. Can, yeah, yeah. So before getting, before asking students the same question, the survey also tried to get a sense of how much time students were spending using their devices for remote learning purposes. And across all grade levels, it was about three hours. Um, outside of just general use of their devices. Yeah, and I would just want to interrupt for one second to say that was consistent with the DESE guidelines this spring, was for people to be, for students to be doing work about half the school day, which is about three hours. So um, just want to note that um, across all grade level spans, um, we hit that mark. Um, sorry to interrupt, Obed. No problem. 
Um, so if we go to the next slide, we'll see that um, in this slide as well, about 76% of students indicated that the time that they had to spend for remote learning was manage was either manageable or or uh, easily manageable. 18% indicated that it was barely manageable and 6% said that it was not manageable. So the next couple of slides, um, another part of the save was just trying to see how parents, staff, and students felt about the communication from the various schools and the district as a whole. So this slide is covering how parents felt. About 67% of parents indicated that the level of communication was either adequate or more than adequate. Another 26% said that it was barely adequate and another seven indicated that it was not adequate. Um, for students, um, about 59% of students expressed that the level of communication was either adequate or um, more than adequate. 34% indicated that it was barely adequate and 7% indicated that it was not adequate. And for staff, um, about 72% 72, 72 of staff indicated that the level of communication from schools and the district was either adequate or more than adequate. About 25% said that it was barely adequate and another 3% indicated that it was not adequate. And so the last cup set of slides, um, as parents were, these slides are gonna portray how parents, students, and staff evaluated the online learning model as a whole. And so for parents, um, parents, uh, about 33% expressed that the online learning model was, that they were either satisfied or very satisfied with it. 38 indicated that they were either dissatisfied or very dissatisfied. That they, were, that they were either dissatisfied or very dissatisfied with it. And about 29 were sort of neutral. They weren't, they didn't have any strong positive or negative feelings towards the model. Um, as far as uh, things for improvement, and this was based on 412 parent responses, um, many parents uh, advocated or expressed a desire for having better communication between teachers, students, and family. And this is sort of a theme that runs across all of the responses for parents, staff, and students just having uh, better communication between students, teachers, and families so as to make sure that students are being held accountable and that students are being made aware of the expectations that they have. Parents also desired for a more organized structure and clear expectations. So that could look like having, for example, one place where students could go to access all of their assignments to be made aware of all the different class times that they have and the like, and also making use of um, online resources such as more synchronous learning and breakout rooms so that students are being engaged in the learning process. And that sort of like feeds into the last category or the last theme that emerged, which is the higher quality instruction. Just having um, the instruction include more rigorous assignments, um, teachers teaching newer content as opposed to just reviewing older content having more individual feedback um, and grading students as opposed to having a credit or no credit grading basis. Um, so when this question was asked of staff, um, about 52% of staff indicated that they were either satisfied or very satisfied with an online learning model. 10% said that they were either dissatisfied or very dissatisfied, very dissatisfied with the learning model. And 38% were sort of neutral. Um, as far as um, emerging themes um, similar to the parents staff also indicated that there needs to be um, more communication between students teachers and families um, there was also a desire for having clear expectations for students basically communicating and making sure students understand that the online learning model was not optional that it was mandatory that their assignments were going to be graded and that they had to participate in virtual learning sessions um, staffs also indicated that they wanted to change the structure of classes, so having more synchronous learning, making more use of the breakout section, breakout sessions, so that students are engaged in their learning process. Um, with that, um, there was also a desire for more professional development around the resources, so that they could be implement, implemented in a fashion so as to promote and enhance the uh, learning experience for students. And ultimately, staff wanted to make sure that they were um, getting a better understanding of the access and support students have so that they could tailor the instructions to be equitable for everyone. Um, and so when we go to students, 
um, students, about 39% of students in the survey indicated that they were somewhat satisfied or very satisfied with the learning model. 26% indicated that they were either dissatisfied or very dissatisfied. And 35% were, uh, were neutral. And so when students were asked about what the district can do to improve, again, uh, more communication between them and their teachers, uh, more clarity about expectations, such as like uh, having a more predictable class schedule, knowing that their assignments are gonna be graded and um, the expectation to participate in virtual learning sessions. Um, and the last uh, emerging thing that came about in the student surveys was a desire for a more organized class structure. So again, having more synchronous learning, being able to have more individual feedback with their teachers, having assignments or being able to collaborate with their peers during class time. Um, and the last thing, um, SERVs also tried to see um, how motivated students were during the process and what they felt were things that could be implemented so as to make sure that they remain motivated. So when students were asked if they had trouble staying motivated, about 82% expressed that they had trouble staying motivated, whether that was sometimes, always, or usually. 14 expressed rarely and 4% expressed that they, did, that they did not have any trouble staying motivated. When students were asked um, what would help them to feel more motivated to complete their assignments, a lot of the same themes that we uh, saw in the previous slide emerged here, such as having assignments that were required, knowing that they were gonna receive a grade on the assignment, um, having a better system for organizing, their work so being able to go to one place to be able to access their assignment and being able to engage with their teachers and peers online um, and as far as the last slide uh, students were asked to uh, make note of any benefits that they experienced during the remote learning process so some of the things that they mentioned was having a later starting time so they felt more energized and because they were able to sleep more and lastly, they had freedom over their uh, schedule. So they were able to have more control over when they were gonna do assignments and what time they were gonna turn it in. And so that, that concludes the distance learning survey findings. And um, I think the one other thing I'd like to share, uh, thank you, Obed, that was uh, really helpful, uh, both in terms of putting together a presentation and your presentation of it is that um, all the surveys, uh, all the raw data is on our fall 2020 planning site. So, you know, we, we um, just took out any identifying information that people put on. Uh, but if anyone's interested in looking through the raw data and not just a summary, uh, we'll eventually get this slide deck on probably on Thursday, if not tomorrow. But the raw data is all uh, available for anyone in the public on our fall 2020 planning site, which is you can link to from our homepage at arps.org. Are there any questions from the committees? Ms. Seeger. I'm curious, uh, for the student count, I noticed there was like 130 or 131 responses. How many students are there in the middle school and high school combined? Yeah, so there's, it's about, we got about 10, 15%, I think of the, I think some of the responses had more response, most, some of the questions students skipped and some of them they answered. So the actual number I think was a bit higher um, but the yield, you know, uh, wasn't as high, you know, we emailed it out to all, um, students. So, you know, there's no way to know if that's a representative sample. So as a, as a overall size, it's a decent end size as a percentage of all students, uh, we would want it to be a little higher, I think, to come to broad conclusions. But I would say that the, um, anecdotal data that we collected, uh, informally throughout the spring, either hearing from teachers or others lined up pretty well with, uh, the survey data that we received. Any other questions? Ms. Spitzer. Yeah, I guess just to piggy piggyback on that a little bit, I, I, my only concern with a, an email survey about remote learning opportunities is that those who have the hardest time accessing remote education are also gonna be the hardest to reach through these methods. Um, and, and I guess that's kind of, I, I feel like we've been doing a lot of surveying and I am generally like, fully behind, I think it's it's good to get as much feedback as possible, but I, I, I would like to see if possible to think about focus groups or just 
qualitatively like trying to reach out to some of those populations that we know are going to be less likely to respond to an email and um I know that there have been some efforts to do this and and but I just think having some reporting back on what you're finding through those ways and trying to balance out some of the um the reporting on the surveys with some more of this qualitative or mixed methods findings would be would be really useful um it takes a lot more time is the problem like a survey is easier to to analyze it's easier to write up and and i want to acknowledge that and i think it's it's i'm not trying to I, you did excellent work on the survey so i want to oh, start okay. with that like I, I think it's important that we're doing this i think it was well you know generally well done but i think i think being also mindful of this you know the, some of the calls to try to to be more inclusive and i think sometimes the survey methodology can can exclude systematically certain groups that we want to make sure we're, we're hearing from and yeah if i could respond yeah. oh i'm sorry that if was i it. could respond to that i agree with Ms. fitzer's comment i think some of our challenge is that about 90 percent of our staff stopped working on june 18th and we've been doing incredible amounts of outreach on multiple topics so i don't disagree with you at all um, we are running into some capacity issues on how many people we have to to work on these projects and so um i, I we run into this a lot i think when we're trying to get opinions you know we do uh we're doing our best and the best isn't always going to capture every voice and, and i think some of the voices particularly for those of you who read through it's a very long document but the raw data on the family survey um we did have some families who were able to speak to their child's experience because the, the child might not have been able to speak to their own experience for a whole host of reasons so that's one of the things that uh, i do encourage the committee and the community to do is to try to look through all three surveys because as Obed mentioned, there were some through lines between those surveys. I mean, you look at the raw data and the specific uh, individual feedback, I think we are able to see some of what you're talking about, Mitt Spitzer. It's hard to capture um, explicitly in a summary um, of literally multiple hundreds of pages of feedback that we received. Um, but I do think that'd be a rich data source, and I encourage the committee members to take a look at all of those. Ms. Spitzer? I, I'm just thinking of some of the, um, if there's any potential for collaboration with um, college students like Obed, who might be interested in doing this type of research, or in the summer, knowing so many opportunities have been closed, and we may be able to take um, advantage of some of the resources in our academic community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I'm not seeing any. I think I can see everybody. Um, I just wondered if, since you know, you talked about it, and I don't want to put her on the spot, but I keep on doing this every meeting she goes to. I don't. Th hopefully, this doesn't discourage her participation in the future. But we do have a high school student present, and not that we're asking her to comment on uh, if she chooses not to, um, and it could be about the survey data and whether it lined up with what her experience or what you know she's hearing from experiences. But we, you know. I don't want to make this a research effort, Emily, uh, at all, but but it certainly want to just invite you if you had something that you'd like to share that you, uh, you know, I'd like to encourage you to be able to do it, but certainly can pass and and feel no obligation. Yeah. We. Um, um, I didn't hear all of what you said, but I think I got it. So, um, from. I think you're good. If you'd like to share your thoughts, you're welcome to. Sure. Okay. Um, so from the people that I've talked to, um, you know, in the school community, I think most of the students sort of felt that um, distance learning wasn't, I guess, what they thought it would be, or it didn't really live up to what their expectations were of it. Um, and I think mostly it's a communication issue from what I've, I've heard. Um, so that goes pretty similar with the results of the survey, but um, coming from like actual students, I know not all of them obviously took the survey, but I think that the results align pretty much with what I've heard, but it's just, yeah. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Any other questions or comments?
I'm not seeing any. So um, that's, if nobody objects, then we'll move on to our next item, which is um, the space study, which is the space, util space utilization study that the district covered. Dr. Morris? Sure. So again, I'm going to present. So um, uh, again, I'll, I'll not be able to see you all. So please uh, pipe up if there's a problem with the sharing or if there's questions. It's a longer presentation and um, the principles are online because they're going to, I'll do an introduction, but they're going to walk uh, the committee and the community through uh, what the schools could look like. Um, there we go. And okay. So Allison, is that clear? Yes. Okay, bright color, it doesn't stay orange. So I apologize about that. <laughs> uh, so um, again, we're gonna mostly focus on space, but I do think it's worth mentioning all the operations because uh, it's not we're not looking at one thing in isolation, all those things mentioned. You've heard me mention these four things before, transportation, maintenance and cleaning, staffing and space. And so I wanted to provide a transportation update for the committee. Uh, obviously this isn't the, the focus of tonight, but we have talked about transportation before. So currently the Amherst Elementary bus runs, uh, there's 42 to 40, about 44 to 52 students per bus. Uh, that doesn't mean all of them ride the bus every day, but in terms of students who have bus stops, we currently and have for many years offered all students transportation. Uh, we've done that even though the district policy, which is still in place, uh, says that we only uh, need to provide transportation or should provide transportation for elementary students who live 1.5 miles or greater from the school. Uh, if we implemented the district policy, we'd be down to 24 to 27 students per bus. Looking at other states, again, Massachusetts hasn't released their transportation numbers. Um, that's in the range of uh, what um, students are in bus. I'm seeing a number of states come out with one student per seat and sometimes a little more if they're siblings. It also doesn't account for uh, families driving their kids, students to school. Uh, the legal limit for elementary students in Massachusetts is transportation has to be provided for students who live two miles or greater from the school. Um, if we went to the legal limit, we'd be, you know, like some communities have, we'd be at 16 to 17 students per bus. Uh, uh, Dr. Morris? Yep. A question from Mr. Menino. Thank you. Does that 1.5 miles mean that you expect a kid to walk 1.5 miles to school? So it's your policy. So I'll just say that um, it's, uh, my understanding is many districts that have that policy assume the families will provide transportation whether that's via car or other mode of transportation. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm in jest about your policy, but it's, since we haven't implemented, it's a little hard question for me to answer, but that is the current policy and the hyperlink on the slides uh, goes to that policy. In Pelham, uh, it's a little bit more complicated actually, because there are fewer students per bus right now, 37 to 43, uh, but the yield is a little different. Um, there's only two buses in Pelham, but uh, one of the buses is more significantly affected if we, we implemented the district policy down to 22 to 32. And if the transportation is divided at the legal limit, we get down to 20 to 26. Um, at the regional level, the secondary level, we're provide, required to provide transportation for students. That's part of our reimbursement that we receive. Um, we get a lot of transportation. It's over half a million dollars a year. Um, and also a comparatively low percentage of students live within a 1.5 or 2.0 mile uh, radius from the school. So even if we implemented it, we'd lose reimbursement and we don't actually get there. So we're sort of obligated to provide that transportation. Uh, that's gonna create problems if there's an effort to get all students in school, because um, there's not that uh, kind of avenue to reduce the number of students on a bus based on implementing a different policy or actually implementing our own policy in this instance. Again, this is a big category, but I did do wanna thank Rupert Roy Clark for doing the analysis. Um, and it's certainly something as you're developing your models, we can come back to. But I think the, the short story is at the elementary level, uh, even if we simply implemented the current school committee policy and uh, students, some families drove, we, we probably could get to where the state's going to land. Uh, that's not true at the regional level. So I'll pause because this is the only slide on transportation if there are questions. Uh, Mr. Demling. So do you know, I'm not familiar with the design of our current buses. If, if we stuck to six foot distancing on a bus, what does that restrict us to? And, so and, if, and then if, we, if we stuck to one, one child per seat, what does that restrict us to? I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm I know that we haven't seen the state guidelines, but our committee has a recent notable right. history of not going to the letter of the state <laughs> guidelines on some things. And so, I'm, I'm wondering where where these numbers would align with some other possible um, limits. 
Yeah, so what I've seen from other states is um, having um, one student in a seat, in each seat, gets you to 24 students on a bus, um, 23 or 24, depending if there's there may be a monitor or something like that, so we want to think through that. Um, and the way I've seen some states do it is that sort of um, on the left side of the bus, you'd alternate from a student sitting on the inside of the left row and the row in front would be to the right side of that row. So you'd sort of stagger it. It'll, it's hard to talk about without a picture, uh, but very similar how we might stagger desks to increase distancing. Uh, I've seen states recommend that uh, they're able to do that and that gets you to either again, 23 or 24 students on a bus. I think some states have gone beyond that and included siblings sitting next to each other as acceptable since they're in the same home. Um, but you know, I, I, we haven't measured it out. It's trying to just guess a little bit of um, where our state land and looking where other states have landed on it. Mr. Sorry, we have a lot of visuals later. So uh, on on the classrooms because that was our focus for tonight. Mr. Demling. Yeah, a follow up on transportation, not to belabor it, but this is one of those really sticky wickets in implementation. So if, let's say we continue to offer, offer transportation at the elementary level to everyone, regardless of your distance from school, which is what we currently do. Uh -huh. um, and and yet the the survey that we did on about, are you likely or very likely to provide your own transport? If those numbers are stay, um, uh, stay more or less the same, is the number of students, regardless of distance from school, who reported back that they would likely need busing around 24 per bus, or is it? I'm trying to I'm trying to line that up with what the survey said. You know sure. what I mean? So, uh, if there was no change in district policy, uh, well, that's not true. There was no change in district practice around transportation, and 30. I think at the elementary level is about 31 percent or something when you just aggregate it out elementary secondary. About 31 percent of families said they would definitely drive their students. Um, and then you've got another 20% that said they, they might. Um, at the definitely level, you can't get all the kids on a bus and get to 23 or 24 students. Um, if you combine the definitely and the, you know, possibly, I think was the word, or probably, you get close. Um, I'm not sure you get all the way there, um, but you do get close. Um, and to be really clear, not just financially, but there's not more buses available and there's not more drivers available, frankly, um, to increase that. So I'm intentionally omitting uh, things that are not feasible, which is adding buses or adding drivers. It's financially not feasible, but actually it's just practically not reasonable either. Um, there's not spare buses around uh, for use and, and certainly we didn't budget for that. Um, so, you know, I think the short answer is you get close. We didn't ask it as a binary, yes, no question, because we were trying to get a read on where families were. If it was a barrier, like we can only do X number of days in school if X percentage of families were drive, um, you know, in, in some of my conversations informally, people are saying, well, I'd be happy to drive another kid if they're in the same class because they'll be in the same sort of pod and, and we can wear masks in the car and keep windows open. So I, I think it'd be close, but I, I can't tell you affirmative definitely that it could work. There's also things in between, right? Could we land to, I'm interpreting Mr. Minino's question, I'm not trying to speak for him, but what would it be if we didn't provide transportation for students who lived half a mile or less away from school, right? That, you know, you might wanna combine strategies of not quite going to a mile and a half or two miles, but trying to see the yield from families and who's willing to drive students in carpool and then adjusting the district practice or even the policy about bus runs to uh, make it all work. I think you'd have to look at both of those, not in isolation, but actually in combination. That was long-winded, I'm sorry, Mr. Demling. Hopefully that made sense. Um, yeah, no, that's good. That's the most sub substantive commentary we've had on transportation implementation so to, to date. So I appreciate it. Before I go on to, I see a couple of hands raised, but I think um, something that you said, Dr. Morris, is, is really, really important um, that's not, actually not on the slide right now, which is there aren't more buses lying around for us to grab. Like the, it's a, it's a, there's a finite number of buses. Um, so when we're talking about models, I think we, we need to make that absolutely crystal clear <laughs> that, you know, there's a maximum in terms of number of students that we can be transporting at any given time. And that's, that is, um, I think, pretty, pretty big constraint right there. Um, so I saw um, Ms. Kenny and then Ms. Spitzer's hands. So Ms. Kenny. Um, I just want to make sure we take into consideration kids who would be walking to Pelham are going to be walking down Amherst Road 
which is not a good place to walk or down North Valley. Um, those are two, I mean, as far as Pelham is concerned, pretty busy streets where there aren't sidewalks and they're very twisty turny. So I think we need to, I know we're at a point where like, we have to make some decisions, but like we're talking about children's safety. I think we have to remember these, those pieces too. Yeah, uh, Ms. Spitzer. Yeah, I think one of the other things I wanted to just bring up and not saying we need to solve this now, but if the problem is that we're probably gonna be seeing um, because of the way housing is segregated in the United States and also in Amherst, um, clusterings based on like socioeconomic status and maybe access to cars is going to be highly clustered. And I think we're gonna see clusters of places where people are really likely to be able to drive their kids and clusters of places where people are gonna be less likely to drive their kids. Um, and then we're, I think the other, so I guess I'm just making a question of whether or not we have the ability to, to map some of this out. Like, do we have GIS capabilities in the schools or even at the planning department in town? Maybe this is too, but, but it seems like in order to create, um, if we're asking about people's ability to drive their kids, we're going to need to know where they live and potentially the other complicating factor, and I'm maybe overthinking this, but is that there may be people who have already formed their own informal pods. And, you know, so like my kids are, you know, we're, we're essentially potting with neighbors or we're essentially, you know, we're potting with this person um, who we're happy to drive them because our families are already having so much connection and we're comfortable with it. And, and do we want to um, ask for not only information about their willingness to drive their own kids, but it seems like at some point we're gonna wanna ask, you know, in the past we've asked, do you have a friend who you'd like to be in your class? And it almost seems like maybe instead of asking about a friend, but do you have a person who you're already having regular contact with who you could drive or who you should be potting with in, in this classroom? So um, I don't, it, it seems overly complex to do this. I don't know if we have the capacity to, but I just wanna put it out there that um, I think geographically, it's not just the number, but it's where they live. And if, if there are these clusters, it's going to be, it's going to make it even more difficult to solve problem to solve. Yeah, no, I think that's right. So I love to, I'd love to live in the school district that uh, sometimes I hear about. Uh, we do have some systems, but it's not. I wouldn't say it's it's fully GIS kind of driven. Uh, but but I think even filled, who filled out the survey that we're basing this on wasn't fully representative, and we have data on that of the entire, um, of all families, you know, we, we did lots of outreach. It wasn't wildly off, but it wasn't exactly uh, describing all of our families. And I think, I think you're right on that front. This is a broad brush and we're trying to do, as you'll see later, uh, lots of work very quickly. Um, but we thought it was good to at least share where we are and our thinking about this and the quick data that we were, I shouldn't say quick, it took a couple people a lot of time to do this. We did map it out about where the lines would be for, um, the school. So we do have some information geographically on where the 1.5 and where the 2.0 is. If this was a full presentation on transportation, I'd have four or five more slides on it. But, um, you know, it's something that we can certainly bring back as we want to think about it. Um, I, I do want to also stress the regional piece, which I'm not getting as many questions about, and maybe because it's more clear, that it's a huge barrier uh, for us at the secondary level um, and, and I'm not sure it's a barrier, frankly, that we can resolve. I think it'll get a little more clear with the space piece in the schools that we have a, we have many, many more barriers at the regional level than we have at the elementary level. And that has not speaking at all to um, uh, elementary students being back being back in class more important, right? That's an educational piece. I'm just talking about logistics and operations. Our number of uh, barriers at the secondary level is high, and transportation is uh, is not low on that list. Thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Lord, you had your hand raised for a while. Yes, thank you. I know this gets into um, contract negotiations and potentially more money and a timing trickiness, but if I'm looking at the Amherst Elementary, there's about a 10 student difference between the 2.0 miles and 1.5, and I'm wondering about a double run for those 10 other students um, and that 20 minutes. And I know when we get to the regional, maybe freeing up an Amherst bus to do regional and doing a double run. I don't know if that could work, but potentially scooping up kids within a mile and a half might be able to be done with a double run. 
Yeah, so uh, we have talked a little bit about that, and that's a great question. I think the barriers for us on that, and they're not insurmountable, but they are barriers. One is financial, as you note. So if we use five-star drivers, they're our vendor. Um, every run costs X amount of dollars, so there would be a financial implication. Uh, for us, at the on a practical level in the building, if we have students getting to schools at different times, same school at different times, it creates some logistical challenges and educational challenges. Um, so it's certainly something we can look at, um, but it would that would trigger us staggering our start times by section. Um, but it really, really wouldn't work that way because it's based on location. So uh, it, it would it would bring about some challenges for us, um, both financially, but but also operationally, and educationally. But it's certainly all options should be on the table. All ideas there are no bad ideas right now. So uh, I'm not at all trying to be dismissive, Miss Lord, at all of that. And and we could take a closer look at that and see particularly for some of the runs that are not that far from the building in densely populated areas, it might not add that much time to do a second run. Uh, if it's something that's far out, like Shootsbury and Leverett doing a second run, by the time that the driver drops off, drives back to Shootsbury, comes back, right, A period is, is done. So, uh, you know, I think we may think of um, some isolated areas that are high density where that could be a very effective strategy. So thank you for mentioning, because we, we loosely talked about it, but not in the level of detail that you just mentioned. Mr. Menina, did you have a question? No. Any other questions on transportation? Not seeing any, Dr. Morris. Sure. So uh, this one may be quicker, we'll see. Um, but uh, maintenance and cleaning, so all filters will be changed before fall return to school. We're intentionally not doing that work now. That'll be done uh, in August because we'd want to replace the filters uh, pretty much right before our staff and, and students return. Uh, exhaust fans, so the preventive maintenance that is happening in process and all belts and motors replaced as needed, again, for ventilation. Uh, we have looked a lot at ventilation. Again, Mr. Roy Clark uh, can come back and talk about that sometime soon, but we are setting that uh, we would meet and, and primarily exceed the ASHRAE standards for fresh air in classrooms for use in fall. And we do that by two approaches. One would be increasing the velocity of the venting the other is running it for more hours. So typically we use the ASHRAE standards and that's where the exceed word comes in. We try to meet the ASHRAE standards, which, which balance um, air quality and energy efficiency. And that's what we aim for. The exceed part is that we do have most of our classrooms we could go above that. It will not meet the energy efficient, efficient ASHRAE standard, uh, but it will meet uh, and go above in terms of air quality and fresh air use. Uh, we've now ordered tents for all schools, most of those, um, for the K to eight anyway, will be in within the next two weeks for outdoor learning. Um, we are also exploring unrelated to tents, you know, like at the elementary level, uh, a model from Finland where there might be 45 minutes or 50 minutes of academics and then 10 to 15 minutes of outside time. Uh, again, so um, it gives um, students and staff an opportunity to be outside every hour and also lets the ventilation system uh, work better. So that is something we're actively exploring at the elementary level. Uh, in terms of projects related to COVID, you know, the quad project at Wildwood is going well. We've already taken out, you know, there's, there's a quad that's truly a havesy, um, as we're calling it now, although uh, Nick and Diane are going to get some feedback from students and staff and try to rename it because havesy is just my silly name. Uh, hopefully they'll come up with something either better or sillier or both. Uh, but the, our facility staff is working on that. Uh, we previously had committed to new flooring and carpets in two quads in the ELL room, and those projects have commenced. Uh, at Fort River, we have signed the contract for a vendor to complete the quad project there this summer. Uh, again, we can get into more detail later, but I want to just give a, a, an update because it's one of our four areas of operations we continue to work on. Unless there's questions, I'll keep on going. I'm not seeing any. Okay. So from a staff update, um, we surveyed staff uh, right after school ended regarding medical needs um, that they might have um, as per CDC guidance and the follow-up conversations with HR in progress. I know a bunch happened today, actually. Um, you know, just going back to budget decisions, we made budget decisions to main, primarily retain our staffing levels. We total, you know, we had 1.0 total, 1 total uh, full-time equivalency or position reduction across three districts and all three districts were, were at or level, near level funded. We cut over a million dollars. And we did that because we wanted to maximize in-school time. If we weren't trying to do that, we would have made some different choices. Um, but it's as we're looking at fall, it's it's becoming plainly obvious that we need to have increased staffing levels if indeed we are going to have in-school services. Um, we have initial scheduling models to reduce the number of classrooms at 
um, that teachers staff teach in per week. And, and there's multiple examples of this, but one, uh, one that's easy to describe uh, and important is elementary specialists. So for instance, at Wildwood School, elementary specialists would see 21 classes a week. We would not have that in place next year. You know, we're working on models that would essentially reduce that by two thirds to three quarters by having an elementary specialist having a set schedule, set classes that stay constant for an extended period of time before changing. Um, and that's a recommendation from our health department um, as well as from CDC. The personal protective equipment, 90% um, of that orders in, it's huge pallets where I am in the middle school. Um, and, and maybe I'll just read, read through uh, what's been ordered and, and most of that's here. It's 100,000 three-ply adult masks, um, 16,000 pediatric surgical masks, 13,000 KN95 masks, 180 reusable face shields, 240 reusable eye protection goggles, uh, 9,600 isolation gowns, um, the number of gloves, I'd have to do a lot of quick multiplication, so I'm not going to do that, but it's in the thousands. Um, you know, hand sanitizer, foam sanitizer refills, wall dispensers, because some of our classrooms have uh, sinks and some don't, so we have a significant number of wall dispensers for that, sanitizing wipes, uh, all those in the thousands. And, you know, I want to thank Jill Consolino and Rupert for working quickly on that list and not waiting for the state order. We followed the state guidelines on what to order. Um, but we feel like we're in very good shape with our personal protective equipment um, for staff members, both for the um, most staff members and then also the specific pieces like isolation gowns and other things for um, primarily for staff members who work with um, our youngest students in preschool as well as um, some of our special needs students as well. Um, so that's where we are on staff update. Um, I'll pause and then uh, after this we can get into the space, which will be the bulk of the conversation. Mr. Demling. So on, on the last point, um, PPE for staff who work with students um, with intensive needs. So, you know, we have students, we have student populations, we have programs uh, where we're going to have teacher and student settings um, where, where we can't rely on consistent following of, of masks and or distancing. You know, it's just for one reason or the other. Um, so can, can you talk a little bit about, about what, what the initial discussions have been about how we, how we ensure staff safety, how we maximize both staff and student safety in, in those situations um, and, and what kind of, um, you know, any lessons learned so far that, we've, that we have uh, uh, seen from other, other uh, places in the world that have, that have begun this? Yeah, so in many places, that's actually the first population that's come back is students with more intensive special needs. Um, and part of that's because that's a population, um, just quite candidly, despite everyone, and I'm not talking about an Amherst uh, or a region or a Pelham thing, just in general, that's a population of students where distance learning uh, for many of those students does not meet their needs, not meet their learning needs or social emotional needs. And so that's really where we get into the isolation gown, it can 95 masks, uh, the types of PPE, um, frankly, that mirror what happens in hospitals or in doctor's offices, while we're not getting into that level of invasiveness of incubating our students, um, we're mirroring in terms of the PPE, uh, what's being recommended to us um, to do. And um, I think one of the pieces that, um, two pieces I want to mention, one is that we actively are thinking about what level of inclusion makes sense for students, that we may want to really work with students uh, on acclimating them to uh, their new environment. And the other one, and I think this is really critical, and, and I think we'll talk more about this over time, is making sure that we're building in staff training for both professional staff and paraeducator staff on this. It can't be happening just before school, before school starts or a one-day training. It's an ongoing type of uh, time that our staff will need that they have not needed before if students return to school. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of what we've done for PPE, we've again mirrored the experts. You know, Mass General Hospital expert was the one who kind of worked on this uh, this list for districts of what to buy. Again, we adjusted it a little more on the student side, a little reduced on the uh, the general staff side because so many of our staff indicated that they're already wearing cloth masks. So we want to be cautious of how many disposable masks we bought. Still, hundred thousands a lot, um, but it's really where we get to the KN95, some of the pediatric surgical masks for you know thinking through uh, the face shield, the reusable eye protection and goggles, the isolation gown, uh, the nitrile gloves for depending on the needs of a student, uh, that, that our staff are equipped um, in the way that experts at Mass General would say they need to be equipped. And then we also really have to think about program design. And that's where going back to the guiding principles on specialized program are critically important. 
um, that we're, uh, our staff came up with those and we're following those to a T. Uh, but I think of all students in our district, um, perhaps somewhat ironically, the students who um, may have the hardest time in terms of uh, all the things you mentioned are also the most critical ones for them to have in-person education. Like if I was prioritizing my list, they would frankly be at the top of the list. Um, and so I think it's it's to that reason that we, you know, purchased the equipment we purchased. Uh, we went above the state standards uh, on that because state um, documents and guidelines, because we know we have, we maintain a higher population of students with intensive needs in our district than the state was going to average. So we increase our purchase, we increased our purchasing for those students. Um, but a lot of it's around training and support and um, and some of that even could be done with some of the summer programming that we're doing. If once we get a sense of what the plan is, uh, we can even integrate that and work with families uh, in the summer before the school year starts. Sorry, long-winded answer, but a really important question. I don't think there's any such thing as a short, uncomplicated answer to any. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? I'm not seeing any, so we can move on. Okay, so space summary. Um, so um, we, we did this part for staff. We had a staff town hall meeting right before this. Uh, we really, we just had time to run through this because we felt it was really important as a leadership team that our staff were able to see this um, and not be surprised by seeing it in the public meeting with everyone. So we had about 160 staff members uh, log in uh, and our principals did very similar thing to what to do it tonight. Um, so we wanna thank all the staff members for participating in that. So what we understood is that the school committee requested that we work with desk arrangements uh, to support six foot guidance between students and staff members as per the CDC. And the way we looked at that is uh, mid desk to mid desk uh, between students. Um, and so what you'll see on the following slides has that. I think one thing that uh, Ms. Consolino, uh, our health director, uh, found out on a call with the Mass Department of Public Health is another reason that, you know, I'll say, you know, I said it, I supported it the last time. Um, the quarantine piece, so if a student is suspected, or a staff member for that matter is suspected, um, but let's stick with student as the example, of having uh, COVID-19 uh, before they're tested, they're, there's going to be a need to quarantine everyone who spend more than 15 minutes, because that's the duration period, uh, less than six feet, uh, less than six feet from that student. Uh, I'll tell you that, you know, COVID-19 symptoms uh, are <laughs> similar to the symptoms of a cold, are symptoms of the, similar to symptoms of the flu, they're similar to symptoms uh, of allergies. And so to imagine us being below six feet and the level of quarantining that would need to happen and immediate dismissal of all those students uh, would be highly disruptive. So I say that just to reinforce that um, I'm supportive of the six feet uh, that you all talked about, but I think on a practical level, I wasn't aware of the quarantine piece till Ms. Consolino had the call with the Mass Department of Health. Uh, we've also been consulting with the Amherst Health Department on all this work. Uh, so what we did is we mapped out the rooms with windows. We are not planning on using any rooms without windows uh, for ventilation purposes. We tested different desk configurations, uh, both literally on the ground as well as on paper. Uh, we removed communal use rooms and looked broadly at what rooms could, could work for groups of students. And we also matched the anticipated enrollment to space capacity. We know that enrollment's not likely to be 100%, but we have to plan for that in our work. Uh, we labeled the grade levels logically. It wasn't randomly done, and you'll hear that from principals, but it's for display purposes, and we're looking to get more feedback. I know we will from staff and from the community around that. Just a reminder, the maps are not close, to, not to scale. Some are a little closer than others, and we, we did note that tents will be there. We didn't note the location because we're still working that out, um, and that some of these spaces will need technology to ensure they'd be ready to go in September because they're not typically used as classrooms, and we'd be planning to use them, um, and so... I think with all those caveats, um, the first school is Fort River. So Diane's on the phone. So I'll introduce Fort River. Oh, I have one more before Diane goes. Uh, so just a chart of the three foot, three foot separation versus six foot. So on the left is a slide literally copied uh, from a DESE document emailed to superintendents about the DESE and the World Health Organization model of three foot distancing. This is a typical size classroom at the secondary level. This would be really small at the elementary. I can uh, we have a couple, and we'll, you'll hear about them, that have about 750 square foot of usable space. Uh, most of our elementary classrooms are, are significantly larger than this. But at three feet, you can see that the, the DESE um, slide shows that 32 individual desks fit. Um, and then the right is the CDC model that, that we're planning on uh, implementing, or this is all based on. 
and you can see if it's 16 individual desks, there's also a lot more teacher space um, to use. I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't, wasn't able to figure out how to move the teacher space line down, but just comparing it, you could see that there's much more teach, uh, significantly more teacher space. Um, and we often have multiple teachers because we believe in inclusionary practices. So that was really important to us as well. Um, every classroom is different. This is looking at one with particular dimensions, but we, we, I wanted people to see the visual of three feet versus six feet because I thought it was important for people to consider. Any questions on this before I go to the fort? I'm not seeing any. Okay, very good. So Fort River, um, so um, I've done enough talking, so I think I'm just gonna turn it over to Diane to um, take us through uh, changes at Fort River and uh, what were some of the initial decisions and how they were made. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me. So as Mike described, uh, the first significant change is moving from quads to duos. Those of you that are familiar with the Fort River structure, um, in 1973, big open classrooms were built and have been modified over the years to have kind of partition walls. And for the sake of ventilation, those partition walls need to come down and actual walls need to be built to clean up our ventilation and not cross circulate all of our air. So in retrofitting the school, we end up with, instead of quads or three rooms to each large space, we end up with duos or halvesies, whatever we choose to call them for lack of better terms. Um, so our, our class sizes in those rooms um, lead us to basically 12 classroom spaces plus three for the, for the kindergarten, which is 15. Well, if we use our projected numbers, we needed 18 classrooms. Uh, so we had to look outside of the typical spaces that we were using for classroom spaces. Um, again, taking into consideration where we have windows and also where we have sinks. The places that we went to first were what we used previously as the music room, what we used previously as the art room, and one of our cafeterias. Um, so it also leaves very large spaces. The duos will be large spaces, so we, we can continue our projected class size as we had originally anticipated even before the shutdown. Um, so the other consideration we thought in placing our classes in certain areas is bathrooms and knowing that our K-2 kids, we really wanted to make sure that they had a bathroom in their quad. Um, and we also wanted to consider a few moves as possible because it's pretty laborious to move, um, move belongings that belong to a certain grade level. Um, so we ended up with this structure, also trying to keep our grade levels uh, close in proximity if we possibly could. And the last consideration was, again, class size. And our fifth grade classes are projected to be the smallest in the school. So they would be assigned to the two areas that are the smallest in square footage, which is the music and art room, the former music and art room. So we end up with this layout, which does cluster the kindergarten together, the second grade together, and the first grade together. And clustering kindergarten and first grade is essential also because of the Caminantes program, because we have staff that are shared across that program. Um, so having them in the same former quad or right next to each other is essential to the continuing of that programming. Um, we also are able to maintain sixth grade where they were and fourth grade where they were with an addition of a new section going in there. Um, so a few classroom placement changes. We also are restructuring our office, of course, to uphold what is required for a quarantine space for if we have sick kids close to the nurse's office. Um, you'll see that in every school that there's a quarantine space. We also have tried to reassign where some of our adults go, kind of as landing places. Those that don't have a specific classroom will be paired up and will have kind of a, a place for their prep period to continue. Um, we also are gonna be reconfiguring a little bit inside the office just to potentially protect the office staff as well. Um, and one of our cafeterias is potentially gonna be held for um, overflow to our program. So speaking to Mr. Demling's concern about space, we already have an additional space for one of our specialized programs outside of that program because we know students sometimes have varying levels of need. Um, we're also trying to look at one of our cafeteria spaces to be an overflow to that as well. Um, and the last thing to support the programs is we have met with Rupert to uh, our, our facilities director to see if we can make some modifications to the actual classrooms that house the programs. So they're more conducive to having more students that are able to do academic tasks for a longer period of time in those program rooms. And of course, um, the tent outside is something we're gonna encourage use of as well as our garden for as much outdoor activities as possible. Thanks, Anne. I think the only thing I'll add is that just if you're wondering the size of those halvesies or duos, it's about 1900 square feet of usable space. Um, the quads, because they a significant amount need to be reserved, 
uh, we had architects estimate less than 700 square feet. So they're, they're not quite three times as big, but they're almost three times as large as the quads were in terms of usable space. Wow. Uh, Mr. Mini, question? Am I, just a point of clarification, am I to assume that all these configura configurations that we are going to be shown accommodate all existing students? These plans will fit all existing students, yes or no? So, uh, I mean, I can answer more generally, not just for Fort River. We'll be explicit when they don't. In Fort River's case, the answer is yes. The student, this school used to have over 600 students and has um, like 330 projected. Um, so this is one of our best examples of being able to de-densify an existing building uh, and safely fit um, the entire population. That is not going to be true for all of our schools. Thank you. Any other questions for Fort River before we move on to um, Pelham? I think it, it might be obvious, but I just so just to state the I'll ask the obvious question so that you can state the obvious. This assumes that there is no use, um, no meal service in the cafeteria. Yes, right. correct. All of our, Sorry, I didn't mention that. Yep, yep all of our classes. schools. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, what Ms. Chamberlain said, and all, that's true for all of our schools. We're, we're not envisioning, um, and the guidance we've received is not to have cafeterias in use as food service um, at all. Uh, Ms. Spitzer. And I think the other point of clarification, if somebody's not familiar with this building, and I'm um, more familiar with Wildwood, but I believe that for some of these spaces, there are windows that you wouldn't necessarily assume. So like the blue room for the overflow space, like that doesn't necessarily look like it has a window, but, or. That's correct. That's why it's only designated as overflow space. It will only be used if necessary. Okay, so the mail, but are, are there areas where there are like these courtyards in the middle in these buildings or is that may not be obviously um, have windows to somebody who's just looking at this diagram? So there are still courtyards, yes, at the um, inside part of each quad, there's still extra rooms, but each quad will now have full access to see windows from door to window. So every halfsy will have the full um, bank of windows at the end. It's actually an improvement in light to all of the instructional spaces. Yeah, and to your point, the orange cafeteria is not drawn. This is where the scale part comes in because it actually extends quite a bit below the office area. So it does have significant windows to a courtyard and it's not really reflected um, in this kind of more simple map. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions? There aren't okay. any. Thank you, Ms. Chamberlain. Thank uh, you. We'll, go on to, we'll go on to Pelham. Uh, so uh, Lee's with us and um, Pelham is another school where from a space perspective, we are able to um, design spaces that would fit all students in Pelham, uh, but there would be some changes needed to accommodate that. Um, so I'll turn it over to Lee for sharing more information. Hi, good evening, everyone. It's good to be with you. So. The map of Pelham looks relatively similar to how it has looked in the past. Um, so when we were looking at space configurations for the fall, our big priorities were to keep children in developmentally appropriate learning environments, keep cohorts of students together and maintain our current staffing levels. So you'll notice a few changes to this map. So our enrollment for grade four is currently a little higher than some of our other grade levels. Um, and so we have, we're proposing to move fourth grade into the cafeteria and convert that to a learning space in order to keep the cohort of fourth graders together. Um, the next piece is that the grade two classroom was originally built to be a specials area and is significantly smaller than some of the other classrooms in the building. So you'll see that second grade is in what it was formerly the fourth grade space so that we can, again, keep the second graders together as much as possible um, and fit more students into the learning space. You'll see, as Diane mentioned, there's a quarantine room, which was formerly our technology lab. Um, it has great proximity to the nurse's office. Um, as 
as well as being really centrally located in the school. Um, and then the final piece is that we're looking at our enrollment numbers, recognizing that they're subject to change and thinking about the potential of a multi-age first and second grade classroom. So right now our, our enrollment for first grade is a little bit on the low side compared to the other grade levels and our enrollment for second grade is a little bit higher. So we're thinking through some options that would be the most supportive and developmentally appropriate for those grade levels while also keeping students together as much as possible. So it's a model that we're exploring along with some of the other elementary schools. Um, and then you'll notice the tent, which was already mentioned as well. Um, so we'll be taking advantage of lots of outdoor learning um, come the fall. So it's, it's among the more straightforward maps that you'll see this evening, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Or Mike, please jump in if I left things out too. No, I think I think that was um, spot on. Um, you know, and just to be clear, the overflow space is that room eighteen is is what's thought of when when um, Lee was talking about second grade. It's it's that one's the one when I was referencing the space uh, at the beginning of this. Um, that's a very small elementary classroom. It's only about I think seven hundred forty square feet, something like that. Where the other rooms are significantly larger, and that's why. Uh, when we looked at enrollment, it didn't really make sense to try to fit a full class in there because um, it, it's a little, it, it is tighter than all the other spaces in Pelham. Any questions for us? And uh, Mr. Menino. I can't see it on my computer, but that pink room next to the second grade, what is that? So that is what we, it's labeled on the map as the quarantine room. So it was formerly oh, okay. the computer lab but the space is just too small to safely and comfortably fit students to apart. I understand. Sure. And Ms. Baker? Just for my own curiosity, on average, how many students do you imagine having per grade, like in the third, second, fifth, and sixth grade classroom? So, and Lee, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that those rooms, um, kindergarten's a little bigger, yeah. uh, fourth grade obviously is different, that they would max out at 18 students. Is that yeah. what you're remembering? Yeah. Um, I believe that was it. As, um, they're they're uh, about 100 square feet larger than the uh, models from DESE and uh, the, the 16 square, uh, 16 desk model that you sh was shared earlier that was 750 feet. I think these are about 90 square feet larger. So there's the ability to have um, two rows of four and two rows of five. Yes. So they're, um, they're about 840 square feet. So the first grade room, the third grade room, fifth and sixth are all about the same size. Um, so we did, we did measure out that 18 students could fit. And with more students being able to fit in the kindergarten room, which is about 1,100 square feet. And then the cafeteria learning space is just about 1,000 square feet. So um, we projected that we could comfortably fit 21, 22 students in those learning spaces. I'm not seeing any more questions from Okay, so thank you, thank you, Lee, and Nick will come up and um, well, it's a different orientation and different map. Um, it, the buildings are very similar at Wildwood and Fort River, so uh, there's, there are differences that Nick will highlight, but this should look uh, sort of similar if you turn it 90 degrees um, to what, you, what Diane spoke about at Fort River, but um, I'll turn it over to Nick. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for helping us try to figure this all out. So like Mike said, at, at Fort River, Wildwood's very similar. I think uh, uh, that the figure 1900, Mike, makes me realize why it looks so big when I went in there the other day. These have these, are, they're enormous. And, um, and so creating them, like Diane said, created 12 rooms instead of 24. And our goal was 21 classrooms based on current enrollments. Um, so then counting the three kindergartens, that, that brought us up to 15. And similar to Fort River, when we looked at the, the halvesies, they each have bathrooms, they each have, a, they each have sinks. And so we thought that the younger children, grades one, two, three, and four, would fit into the halvesies. And that worked out mathematically. 
we put them all side by side um, just so that therefore teachers could be in close proximity to each other. They are building walls that go across the rooms, but they are leaving one door um, in case a teacher needs to check in or with a colleague next door. So then we were looking for six other spaces. And so if you look at the map across the green are two cafeterias plus what used to be a fourth cafeteria space is now a movement room. And so we put uh, grades five in there. Uh, again, to try to keep the grade levels closer to each other. They each have uh, windows that open wide and, uh, and two of them um, open into a courtyard that was redecorated a few years back by the Rotary Club grant. And so that offers an outdoor, nice outdoor learning space. And then in the orange, uh, that's our ELL room, art and music room. And that's where right now we're proposing putting grade six there. And once again, grades five and six could walk to uh, bathrooms that are in the hallway. <clears throat> um, I don't, and you know, other than that, I, um, the library is, is right now is a potential overflow space, though we do have also the use of a middle cafeteria that's not highlighted at all as potential overflow as well. There it is, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then also we have a, we call it the green room in here, but those spaces weren't considered, um, particularly the, uh, the library and the green room because they did not have, win they don't have windows. Um, and then similar to Fort River, we have a, a light blue space as part of the offices. Um, that would be the quarantine room. Uh, anything else, Mike, that I've left? No, we just I don't know if the committee has any questions about Wildwood, but I think you 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 got all the the details. I, actually, the one thing I'll say is that one unique piece of Wildwood and Fort River that people may not focus on is the kindergarten rooms are unusually large. You know, as I recall, there's something yeah. of like 1,300 square feet. They're much much larger than MSBA would allow us to build now, uh, but they do provide uh, a really wonderful space, and and there is a bathroom suite that is shared uh, between the kindergartens, but they're in their suite. Um, but I think it is just worth mentioning those are very large spaces as well. Right, and and similarly in, in uh, the spaces we're looking forward to the, having enough room to do to continue the co-teaching model uh, because the spaces are so big. <clears throat> I'm Ms. Spitzer. Sorry, it's getting dark in my room. Um, <laughs> Hi, one, Terry. Hi, how are you doing? One question Good. I have is thinking through, um, we're, we're going to be trying to maximize outdoor space, outdoor time, and also minimizing time in hallways and kind of shared areas. So um, I guess for Fort River and Wildwood, are, and also for the Palomar, or any of the schools we're going to be looking at, how much access is there from the classroom, like a door to the outdoors? Is that something that's available in Fort River or Wildwood, the ones we've looked at so far? Or do they need to go through, kind of all, always go through the corridors in order to access the outdoors? Yeah, so similar, you know, we uh, we definitely want to access the outdoors. And I think, um, so in the, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the, all the halvesies have outdoors uh, doors that just go right out. Yeah, there's that little hand. Thanks, Mike. Um, that go right outside kindergarten as well. Um, to, they also have a, I think it's two out of three, but the third one is right near an outdoor uh, door. Um, I think we'll have to, I mean, we're as a group, we're looking at arrivals, departures, how to get outside, how to have really minimal um, mingling in all ways. And so that's another reason why we would be thinking right now of putting the fifth and sixth graders in spaces where they also, but they they have to move a little further to get outside, but they would have separate ways. So the sixth grade would have one way of entering and leaving the fifth grade would have another. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that is the feedback we received this week from the Amherst Health Department is the more, particularly at the elementary level, that students actually can even enter in through some of these doors in the morning and not have a bottleneck in the front. Right. Or to have different entrances, if we are going to use the hallways, where some students uh -huh. could 
at different ends. Um, so they helped us think through some of that and, and that's sort of the next level of planning we have to do. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, so now we get complicated. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Nick. Uh, to Mr. Yeah. Mead's point, I also want to, as we're transitioning to Mr. Shea, just note that um, Ms. Westmoreland did all the color coding and a lot of the design work with principals. So I want to publicly thank Ms. Westmoreland for making these um, so easily visible about where things would be. Um, so um, you all know her well from her prior, or many of you know her well from her prior role, but I think she was really outstanding in this regard. So uh, the first three schools we went over, um, based on our analysis at six feet, the students fit. That is not true for Crocker Farm, uh, pre-K to six. And so uh, Mr. Shea will talk through, Derek will talk through some of those pieces, but I wanna preview that um, there's two grade levels not on this sheet from Crocker Farm, and those are fifth and sixth grade. And, and we'll work on uh, sharing why that is and, and why the efforts to identify at Crocker Farm uh, aren't able to maintain the whole student body and staff uh, as the other three elementary schools. But I'll uh, I'll turn it over to Derek. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I see it's getting dark outside. I was actually just looking at my phone there, and in my dad's village in Scotland, the last light is 11.24 p.m. this evening. So uh, 3,000 miles away. Uh, anyway, um, so thank you for uh, having us. Just a, maybe a couple of things to get started. I, um, I want to thank Mike for um, saying right at the beginning that as you look at the crop farm map, you will see that there's a pre-K through four plan, not a pre-K through six plan. And certainly some of you may know this, but I mean, I'm, I'm getting into my 11th year at Crocker Farm, 24 in the district. I love Crocker Farm. I love my uh, older students, love the younger students too. But our sixth graders just left, and you know some of those students are working for like seven years, and, and so you develop these bonds and these relationships with kids over long periods of time. Um, but as you look at this map, and, and if you see what it says, Crocker Farm instructional spaces just below that, I think it says that Crocker Farm is approximately seventy-one thousand square foot. Um, the other schools, Wildwood and Fort River, are somewhere in the region of seventy-eight thousand square feet. And so I certainly know next year, our numbers, uh, this year, our student numbers, if, if people could just, um, and, and a bunch of you on this, this call know um, the, the, the Crocker Farm School quite well. So we had 416 students uh, last year at the school, uh, pre-K through six, uh, over 100 staff. Um, next year, uh, our numbers um, in K through six are projected to be 325, which is only five students less than what Fort River would be, but with 7,000 square foot less to, to work with. Um, so it makes for a difficult uh, plan to try and make this work. Um, and so clearly, uh, as you look at it, you'll see, and, and, and someone may say, so why why do we have pre-K in there and not five and six? And I just want to be candid and, and, and offer a couple of quick thoughts on that. So our, our preschool uh, program has shifted all about the district for many years. I mean, I actually, Remember when I worked at Fort River many years ago, working with a number of the preschoolers there, and the preschool um, found a home at Crocker Farm uh, a, a good number of years ago. And what they ended up doing was actually physically building um, preschool setting to make it actually physically right for for, for preschoolers. And so a, a large amount of money was invested to to make those classrooms work down there. Um, and outside space, which was beautifully done in the last year, really fits uh, well with, with the preschool uh, model down there. Um, it's, it's accessible for, for students, 50% uh, of the students who attend the preschool program um, are special education students. That, that's uh, uh, the mandate of the law. Um, and, it, and there's some, a number of students in our preschool have gets fairly complex, uh, whether it be physical or social emotional needs. Um, and what we've learned over the last number of years is that we, we have not had enough space for, for everyone to coexist at Crocker Farm on, on a quote regular year, uh, whatever that may mean. Um, and it's always been very tight. It, it, it's been a very uh, a tight space to work. So when we went through all of the classrooms, um, if you look in the back hallway there, for example, the, the sort of green colors and yellows and blues, I don't know what the other one is, um, not very good at colors. Um, but you're talking about uh, these 11 hallway classrooms in the back where I went into the school myself um, and, and Mike was in with me one day, but I'm back a couple of times just to sort it out. And, and you can look and you see the rooms, they can accommodate 15 desks and 15 chairs and one teacher desk, and that's about it. 
and 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 uh, I've done that a number of times to go in and take a look at it. There's cubbies in those rooms that make it a little bit difficult to to get more space. There's also uh, egress issues in terms of uh, wire codes. If you look what it says, room 34, 35, 36, those are little pathways that need to be left open for students to be able to exit um, the property pro properly. Um, you can see probably in this map as well that we've we've got two kindergarten classes scheduled, but our numbers right now are such that we may have to go to a third class because we have probably 15, 16 we can get in those kindergarten classes, but we're, our numbers are a little higher right now. So at some point, you know, Mike and, and the district's going to have to make some decisions about that because our numbers are like 38. I think the last time I looked might even be a little higher. Too high for, for regular kindergarten, previous years, good numbers, but too high for what the, the physical distance uh, uh, Rules safer right now. Um, we've got a one-two pegged in for for one of our, our grades. We've got too many students to to make it work in two first grades, and um, we've got too many to make it work in for three second grades. We've got this sort of like overspill number. We're going to have to figure something out. Um, you'll see in the map, you know, a number of third grades. Uh, you'll also see in the map some overflow space. Um, last year during the school year, we had 17 additional students join us after September. That's not a small number of students. It's perhaps plausible, but that number will be smaller next year. But I could only speculate. I, I don't really know how that will shake out. Um, preschool um, has got some additional space granted in this map, and I think um, I think it's going to be necessary. Preschool for many years has struggled to sort of maintain their program with limited space. So in this model here, preschool would get some additional space, and and I I do think it's the the right thing to do. We also have. Um, probably next year, somewhere in the region of 70 plus uh, English language learner students. And 23 of those students, certainly for right now, are students who are just beginner students. And so we're gonna have to figure out how to service our ELL program students next year, because translators, for the most part, I don't think will be getting into classrooms. Um, and, and so we're gonna have to figure out a model for our ELL students. So hence, you'll see there's an ELL classroom um, up there. We may need even more than one ELL classroom. Um, not quite sure how we're gonna figure that part out yet. Um, I'm I'm not sure what else to say about about our sure. I, I thought five six in a second, but I, I'm I'm obviously a little anxious talking about this because it's not something I would I'm excited to talk about. Um, right, Derek, do you mind if I jump in for a quick second just to add? No, I'd love it. <laughs> about the five six. So just one other additional detail in the pre-K is that as opposed to the K to six or K to 12 program, there's different EEC requirements about number of kids who can be in a classroom uh, as well as movement spaces. So you're gonna see it's a significantly more space for preschool and that's just based on what we're, how we're reading the EEC is early education care, I think, or committee, I, I forget the acronym, but it's basically the governing body for early childhood centers in the Commonwealth. And there are some different rules than for DESE. And so it's making sure that uh, we're not looking to expand our preschool offering. You know, this is actually just maintaining it, but we know we're gonna need more space. Uh, second thing that is more challenging at Crocker is that the cafeteria is not a space. It's a huge space without windows that open. So it's not a space we can, is functional as a classroom. And the same a little bit for the library, there are windows in there, but the orientation of the space doesn't make it suitable. So some of the other schools, elementary schools, were able to be uh, differently creative on space. It just, it's not possible at Crocker Farm. We weren't willing to, cut corners and you know in terms of the public health and the six feet and uh, the orientation questions and additional vari variables these back spaces and then four five and six they have built-in cabinetry we really can't remove and that cuts in the space you may be wondering why does crocker farm have fewer kids in a classroom than the other schools it's because there's built-in furniture that makes us fit 14 15 students in a space as opposed to the other schools that don't have built-in furniture inside the classrooms it's a real barrier. We did explore a little bit about removing those. It would be not removing, it would be destroying those. Um, there was a lot of problems with that. There'd be a lot of problems with the flooring because they're truly built in with the renovation in 2002. But it's a huge barrier uh, in terms of class size and where students go. So I just wanted to be explicit about that piece. Um, and Derek, it's okay, you know, and Ms. McDonald, if we, we just show the five and six on the middle school uh, map and then we can pause for questions on Crocker. Yeah. So here's the middle school, and we'll get to you know uh, Principal Sharon in uh, a little bit. But um, Derek, do you want to just talk through fifth and sixth grade here at the middle school building? Yeah, I'll just say a few brief words uh, because I'm, I'm not an expert. Um, I've worked in a number of schools in town, but the middle school is the one place that I mean I haven't uh, spent a lot of time uh, 
certainly just to go visit my kids when they were there. It looks like the way it's designed right now is that the fives and sixes would be allocated um, a segment of the school, uh, perhaps a wing is the way to, to frame it. Um, and, and then that segment segment in the second floor or fives and sixes would have their, um, their, their own area, uh, obviously their own classrooms, uh, their own bathrooms, um, their, their, their own ability to have space for, for their teachers that work with them in the areas, areas special education teachers, ELL teachers. Um, also, when I was um, uh, meeting with Mr. Uh, Sharon today, uh, Diego today, we realized that the five and sixes would also have the ability to have their own uh, way to enter and depart the, the property. Um, and so thus they wouldn't have to come in through the front door with the, with the older students. And, and certainly I think um, Diego and I had made this commitment as we were chatting today that if this holds to be true, that we would um, certainly spend as much time as possible in the next coming weeks to, to continue to look at what would make sense for, for our five and sixes. But I do like the way that they've got their own sort of separate quarters uh, designed up there. So uh, I'll pause here, um, you know, before we talk about the middle school specific to arms, um, to, uh, if there's questions about Crocker Farm. Mr. Menino. Support services and access to the principal. How do these students in a different location locate you? Right. And so we've had initial conversations about that, about, you know, just very bluntly, there would need to be someone with administrative credentials in that role on site. It's, this is over 100 students. Um, and we wouldn't put that on, you know, Mr. Sharon or the middle school. There's certainly from a safety and security perspective, there would need to be coordination. But from an instructional leadership perspective, we'd want that. So we have a couple ideas on how that would work. Uh, at this point, we're looking at space, um, but I think you hit the nail on the head that we'd have to have an administrative, administrative model to support that. And, you know, I've talked with Ms. Smith, the assistant principal, as well as Derek, uh, had some initial dialogue about that. And so if this ends up being a model uh, that the committee wants us to explore in more detail, then we can kind of flesh that out. Ms. Spitzer. So I, I just wanna kind of, Pose the question because when um, not suggesting this is a solution, but given what Mr. Menino just brought up, so when I was at Carter Farm, we I was in a modular classroom. So I think there are good reasons that we probably don't want to go the modular classroom route. But I'm assuming that people in our community might raise the question. So, um, what are the advantages of, of going to the middle school over over doing something like building a bringing a modular classroom onto onto the site at Carter Farm? So I can take a stab at that, Derek, unless you'd like to. I would prefer you did, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about seven classroom spaces, um, and that's a lot of modular spaces. I don't know the size of modular classrooms. I remember the ones over at Mark's Meadow. Uh, Nick remembers them better than me, probably. Um, my recollection is they were long but narrow. Um, I, I also think from a cost perspective, um, that'd be a huge expense. Uh, you know, it's certainly something we could explore if that's what the committee wants about what the cost is and availability of them uh, to be here on site in time. The other piece, which is which is perhaps neither here or there, but um, when we think about de-densifying, I just, I do feel like there needs to be fewer bodies on site at Crocker Farm. And so the idea of modular takes care of one issue, which is instructional space, but on a larger scale, um, it already feels very full at Crocker Farm with the current number of students. And I think finding an outdoor area to put six or seven modules, maybe get one more class in and one of those overfill spaces, um, it's still the same number of bodies on site. It's still the same number of cars, buses. And so um, I guess I have a, a, a bias against that. And it's not that my bias can't be overcome. It's certainly the school committee uh, can ask us to explore that and we can get back to you. But, you know, that was certainly my thinking. It, we did talk about that a little bit. Um, but um, when those were on, it was during a construction project and no one speaks super fondly of that from the staff. And I was still, I still got to Crocker Farm in 2007, I think it was, where people were uh, still uh, reliving the construction years. Um, and not always so fondly. So I think given the alternative, it's certainly something we could explore because they may not view this model so fondly, but I really do worry about uh, the capacity um, to, to pull that off for early September from a functional perspective, cost perspective, and then what does it mean uh, if you're really just spreading students out outside, does that cut on the outside space that we want all these students to have? 
Um, so those are my initial thoughts. Um, I haven't done as much deep thinking on it, but again, that's something we could explore if the committee like would like. Ms. Kenny. So I see in this pink corner, I'm not sure if it's a Crocker Farm question or a middle school question, but it looks like room, I'm gonna go with C44 because I, I need new glasses right. and see this is little um, yeah. down in the bottom like left-hand corner. All of the rooms around there look like they have no windows, look therefore are not being used, but this says, I think it says specialized programs in it. So does that room have windows and ventilation? Yeah, so the answer to that is it does. It, it has windows into a courtyard that you can't see because it's not shown on the map. It's sort of the only one of those interior classroom-ish areas that actually does have windows. Um, so it doesn't look like it on this map. It looks like the library extends, but there's actually a courtyard right here um, that doesn't extend all the way there, but it extends to right here. So there is there are windows to a courtyard. Mr. Demling. <laughs> um, did, did I miss it or did you describe what combined fifth, sixth grade uh, means? You did not miss it. And uh, Derek, I'm sorry, did you wanna? I was just trying to um, get Peter's question there. Um, were you looking for the numbers or for the plan, Peter, for, in terms of? Uh, well, like just was like, what does it mean? Does that mean we're educating fifth and sixth graders at the same time in a, in a new hybrid kind of class model or is it in the morning it's fifth grade and the afternoon it's sixth grade? Yeah, no, I, I think um, I, I think that the the way that we've got so there's approximately give or take whatever it plays out there's approximately 110 students who are in fifth and sixth grade for next year for Crocker Farm, and the way the numbers are set up right now we would um, and looking at the and again I don't know the middle school as well but certainly knowing the the numbers in terms of students per classroom, we we would ideally have not ideally we we would have uh, three uh, fifth grades just like we would normally have three fifth grades at Crocker Farm three sixth grades, and then we would be looking to perhaps develop a five, six classroom because we have, again, this sort of funky number where we'll get too many fifths to make, you know, three classes and, and too many six for three classes. So we need to do something, a hybrid in the middle somewhere. And so it is a little bit of a, come back to your cricket reference earlier of sticky wicket, right? We're in a little bit of a, a, a sticky situation and, and we're trying to sort of like um, figure out that, that that's the one place where, yeah, we. We would hybrid it into like a five six. So you'd have seven, theoretically seven classrooms at the middle school operating in an elementary school model. Um, so I apologize. I can't see everybody on screen when we're presenting, but um, uh, we have a question from Margaret and then a few questions from Mr. Harrington. Thanks, Allison. I was waving like crazy, so I figured you couldn't see me. Yeah. Um, so I have a question about the tent. Um, you're showing one tent here at the middle school, and I guess maybe I have two questions. Is the intent to have one tent per school, or does this simply represent that there will be tent space? And is there going to be, if there's only going to be one per school, are you going to have one for the middle school and one for the fifth, sixth grade students? So at the current time, we have one for the site to answer your question. So it would be, you know, what's been ordered is one for the middle school. And so for the fifth and sixth graders to have that kind of opportunity there, they would have to use the same one that's used by the middle school? Yeah, I think when we go through the middle school, let's come back to this question okay. because I think it'll, it'll, the size of the adult of students in this school will be similar to the number of uh, students that would be in the other elementary schools based on who will fit. But uh, since we haven't done the middle school, I haven't been able to explain that one yet. So come, okay. let's come back. Okay, thank you. Mr. Harrington. Yeah, all right. So um, I guess my, like, my first question would be, um, so this is regional space being, being occupied or used, sorry, utilized by, uh, an Amherst school is—is is there any sort of a sort of compensation that needs to be provided from Amherst public schools to the regional public schools since we're, we're going to be providing regional services and 
such in there too. Yeah, so I think that would be a discussion for the committees to have. Um, you know, in terms of rental of space, we looked at this when we were looking back at sixth grade to the middle school a while ago. Um, you know, in terms of staffing, we would imagine this to be Amherst Public School staff. So I don't think that is a conflict financially. But in terms of rental of space, um, there has been dialogue for many more years than I've been involved on what that would be. And um, I don't imagine that to be a huge sum, but that would be something for the Amherst School Committee and the Regional School Committees to discuss. But when we say fifth and sixth grade at Crocker Farm, we're, we're what we would be talking about from a staffing perspective is fifth and sixth grade teachers and paraeducators um, at the Crocker Farm. There would probably be some shared staff in terms of the nurse. That's the one area that comes to mind most acutely. Yeah. And then um, also, I got a couple more here, but uh, so in terms of, of, of parents who, who might object to sending their fifth or sixth grade student to, uh, to the middle school, is there space to accommodate those students in, in fifth and sixth grade in the other two elementary schools or, or three actually elementary schools? Good question. Uh, I, not that I see. Um, Fort River is the one with the most uh, space per student if you did like the math of it, but because of the specialized programs uh, that Ms. Chamberlain spoke about earlier in terms of building blocks and AIMS both being on site there and uh, the concerns that we'd want to make sure that there's additional spaces for those students uh, given their disabilities, um, you know, it's not a question I've ex explored extensively. There's certainly not seven extra spaces at Fort River. That I can say confidently. Um, if there was a question, is there fewer? Um, my instinct right now is that um, that would, um, it, I don't want to compromise the experience that uh, particularly the students in specialized programs have. And as Ms. Chamberlain said, trying to think of additional spaces uh, for those students to be in seems pretty critical from our equity lens. So it's a long-winded way of saying, I don't think so. That, that there would be available space. And then my last question for now is, uh, how are we accommodating recess for these students? Like, it, it, for, with my familiarity with, with that particular site, it's, uh, I, I guess, less accommodating for, for recess than, you know, the other elementary schools would be. Yeah, I think there's a lot of physical space over by the ball fields. Um, so in terms of, like, just open space, uh, and that was sort of, Mr. Shea was talking about that earlier, that there would be easy access to being outside. Uh, but you're, you're absolutely right in terms of playground space. You know, um, there's not a play set the way there is at elementary level. So is there literal space for students to be outside, you know, play games, all those things? Yeah. Um, you know, the honest truth is I'm not sure how much access we're going to provide for students to use playgrounds next year. We're still waiting for guidance on that. Um, so uh, you could look at that positively or negatively, but it may not be particularly different than the other elementary schools in terms of uh, having open space, but not using kind of physical play structures. I, I have a um, quick question. How would, um, uh, you, you talked about staffing, that the, the teachers, the paras, um, et cetera, would be uh, staff coming from Crocker Farm. What about specials? So Mr. Shane, I talked about that a little earlier. Was that today, Derek? Yesterday? Something yeah. like that. Um, yeah. And so uh, we do think that there would be sufficient um, staffing to accommodate that with Crocker Farm specialists. I want to say that, you know, we would not want teachers teaching in more than one building in the same day, uh, the specialists. We want them to have, you know, X amount of weeks at Crocker Farm working with fifth and sixth grade, as I mentioned earlier, about reducing the number of classroom spaces they're in. Um, so we're still working out details on that. But in terms of a specialist, you know, with 14 K to four classes at uh, on site at Crocker Farm and seven here, uh, we, we did the math and the, the math works out to do that. We'd have to be a little more explicit as we're developing our larger master calendar. Um, but, you know, in terms of our current staffing models, we'd be able to, to be able to pull that off. It'd be a more intense day for specialists when they're at Crocker Farm uh, with maybe four or five classes and then three or four classes on the days or rather weeks or even maybe even month that they're located at the middle school. Um, so it is something we have thought through. And, you know, as, as Mr. Shea said, neither of us feels great about that there's not space for fifth and sixth grade and yet the public health has to guide our decision making. Uh, but we know specialists play a huge role in students' lives and we want to have continuation of that 
uh, for the fifth and sixth grade students um, if this model went forward next year. I miss anything, Derek, or was that right? No, I just, I know it's getting late. I, I, I just want to reiterate what you just said there. That this is not something that I, am, with all due respect to, to the middle school map that's up in front of me, that I'm not dreadfully excited about you know, coming to present this information. But I do think that, that to try to get close to 500 people altogether at Crocker Farm next year, I think would be problematic based on the, the physical distancing rules that we're, we're echoing. Um, I, I, I don't feel great about this, but it, it's it's the reality that we're sitting in right now that it's difficult. Yeah. And we looked at all sorts of other ways, as Derek said, about preschool and, and the preschool move, because we knew that question was going to come up. And as Derek said earlier, too, even if we were to move the preschool, which programmatically we're not interested in, uh, those preschool spaces aren't great spaces. We couldn't really fill them with 14, 15 kids because they're open door to bathrooms and they're they're different shaped than the rest of this, the classrooms at Crocker Farm. Um, so we did look at every other sort of model of how to avoid this and we came to the conclusion that uh, we could get those students in um, as often as, as we'd like. It fits in the middle school. We thought about, you know, and, and you know, Diego as well as Rebecca and Joseph really thoughtful about where sixth graders would be situated so they could have their own unique experience. But, um, you know, we couldn't figure out a way to make it work on site at Crocker Farm in a safe way. So given the hour, do we want to move on to the middle school? Yes, I'm not seeing any other questions right now. Or sure. <laughs> um, we'll be briefer on the secondary schools um, because the math works out a little differently. And so I don't want to steal uh, Diego's thunder. Uh, welcome Diego, he's a new principal at the middle school. Uh, but the short story is we have a lot of issues with fitting students in and they don't all fit at the middle school. Uh, part of that is based on the number of classrooms currently in use that don't have windows. You can see them uh, in the interior building. Uh, Ms. Kenny asked about some of those earlier. Um, you end up with about 20 spaces that are dedicated to arms that fit about 15 students. So even if we were all fill um, that 300 students, we're anticipating closer to 450 students next year at the middle school. So we did not get to the place where we could fit all students at the middle school. Uh, looping back to Miss, uh, and then I'm sorry, Diego, I will, we'll let you get, jump in in a second. I apologize. Uh, getting back to the question earlier from about tense, you know, if we were in some level of hybrid model here where half the students came in uh, with the seventh and eighth grade students would be in as well as the fifth and sixth grade students, we'd end up about the same size uh, number of students as some of the other elementary schools, pretty identical to Wildwood. Uh, it is across four grade level spans, but in terms of 10 and outdoor space, we'd be talking about roughly similar number of students in the school. Um, but I apologize, Diego, um, if there's, uh, some details you'd like to add that I left out, uh, which I'm sure there are. Please, uh, please jump in. Yeah, no, I think I think uh, you touch on some of the important things. Um, I think one of the things that's that's really critical to uh, to echo from what Derek said earlier is that that we do have a commitment to really working collaboratively on making sure that this is something that's uh, that works out between uh, the Crocker Farm students and the Arm students. Um, certainly. Um, it's it's not ideal to be looking at at cutting down our classroom space so much, uh, but because of the the limited number of classrooms that have ventilation and have windows, uh, it kind of necessitates uh, looking at some of these other options. Uh, we do um, uh, we do plan to use two of the art rooms, which are on the first floor, and the PD center, which is also on the first floor, uh, and uh, you can see those on this map as well. Uh, and the PD Center obviously isn't drawn to scale um, uh, because it's actually quite large, uh, but um, but those would be other classrooms. And then we also have uh, uh, five separate spaces for specialized programs. Um, and even though I know we've had some conversations about uh, whether or not we're actually settled or committed on, on those being in those exact spaces, the idea is that those spaces would be used by ARMS as well. Um, and then that, that leaves a number of, uh, um, well, it, you know, the left and the right hallway both have individual boys and girls bathrooms, which, which would allow uh, the Crocker Farm students to have their, their own separate dedicated restroom. Um, and uh, sorry about the background noise. I have some uh, neighbors who are still celebrating independence. Um, uh, but so, uh, but, uh, but yeah, so that's, 
I'm a bit distracted by that now, uh, I'll admit, but, uh, but also to echo some of what Derek said earlier, uh, not exactly the, the way I imagined uh, coming into the district and the kind of planning and conversation that I wanted to be having with with uh, with uh, colleagues and staff uh, over the summer, but, but just out of necessity, I do feel like uh, there's a lot of uh, thoughtful planning in terms of how to do that and and that would uh you know i know we're not talking about about uh scheduling now and what that'll look like um but i know mike did mention um that this necessitates some sort of hybrid scheduling and, and that's you know that's among the things we're looking at yeah and so thank you diego and i hope you enjoyed the celebrations but um you know <laughs> for thinking about that we'd end up with you know um if this half the students were in for instance that's roughly you know ballpark 225 students uh, and we'd have 20 rooms available. Um, so that, that's a pretty good ratio uh, in terms of number of students uh, in classrooms, but uh, it's just not possible to fit all the students in. Um, so that's where we are at the middle school before we go to the high, Summit Academy in the high school uh, and then perhaps take a, a break because uh, I know we've been at it a while and we have an important conversation to come. Uh, just see if there's any questions from the committee. Mr. Demling. So just to be clear, because we haven't talked about models um scheduling and whatnot you're, you're saying that the middle school space um will only accommodate a maximum of of half the the student population of the, the middle school student population yeah i mean if we max if we maxed out it would be a little bit more than 50 percent um but i think the models are hard to figure out what what's between 50 and 100. i'm sorry diego i, I didn't mean to jump in i can't see you so i didn't i didn't see that you were looking uh, no up. that's okay you said exactly what i was about to say Thank you. Any other questions? And I'll just say, I can't see, I don't think I see everybody. So please um, speak up. Oh, Ms. Lloyd. And um, I, I'm sorry if I missed this, but this is assuming 100% of the families feeling safe bringing their students back to school. Like if a third of Crock Farm families don't, then maybe there's some more removal of the Crocker Farm than more room in the, the middle school for, I don't know. Do you know no, what I mean? I do. I think that's exactly right. You know, our initial survey showed about uh, close to 50% of families said definitely returning. Uh, about 38 ish percent said likely. Uh, that's going to wax and wane probably over the next month. Uh, but I think you're exactly right. If our number drops significantly at Crocker Farm in terms of the number of students who are choosing to come, we would rethink this. But we wanted to plan for our enrollment wise, our worst case scenario. By worst, I don't mean bad, but our worst case scenario means everybody comes back uh, because we sort of we have a hard time planning for students not returning. And, and based on our survey results from a couple of weeks ago, the number of students who definitely weren't returning was less than three percent. Um, so, uh, but I think your, your point's well taken that things could shift as enrollment shift and as models shift and we get more information from families and staff. Uh, you're absolutely right. And that's a, a good point to keep in mind. Okay, thank you. Cause I don't, I know person to person, I hear more than 3% saying they don't feel safe yet bringing their kids back, but, um, thank you for reminding me of the survey. Oh, yeah, and 10% said unlikely to return. So those people might be, you know, if you combine those, I think it ended up being like 13% or so said either unlikely or definitely not. Um, so, you know, I think the 2% was the ones we could like say they're definitely not coming back. But I think, you know, there was that that, that next category up that was unlikely. And I think um, I think we can assume that as well. We just don't want to assume it for planning and be wrong and then run out of space. You know, and I would just add to that that there's been... Uh... And, and I've been looking at this in other places, and and initially some of the parents who decide not to have the kids return uh, change their mind after things seem to be moving well. So for planning purposes, it makes a lot of sense to be planning for everyone coming back. And that way, if people do decide to jump back in, uh, those spaces are already available. Okay, thank you, Diego. I appreciate it. Um... We're going to do. We're going to really try to roll through Summit Academy and the high school quickly, uh, just for time's sake. And and I know there's a lot to talk about here and a lot of work that went into it from principals and Debbie. But um, I also just want to note that it's five after nine. So uh, Dave Slovin, I think, is on the line to talk through Summit yeah. Academy. Sure. So um, I'll go real quick. Um, we actually have two tents, but one of those tents will probably be shared with the PIP program. 
So it's kind of, and we'll, we'll be using that in different ways, but um, we have a need for, we have five uh, teachers, we ha and we have a middle school, and we also have a student support space. So we're thinking about uh, uh, seven spaces. So, so we had to move a around, because if you look at the red, you'll see these two small spaces. We created those to uh, when we moved over to the high school. We are not gonna be able to use those for classrooms. So we have shifted um, to make um, two more pink spaces. One is in room 155. That used to be the middle school uh, for us. And we'll be moving our, our one of our high school classes there. And it's, and it's more than big enough. Also, we'll be creating our, our cafeteria, uh, which is, I don't know, it's, it's called, it's the common room. That'll become uh, probably our math room. And because of that, our, our purple room is often where students would come in, and that's where the office is. There's a student entry into the hallway. Mike, can you show that right there? That where students will be coming in as opposed to going through uh, the classroom space. Also, if you go to the, the blue room, that will become the middle school. And there's actually a door to the outside that you can't see. It's, it's just not on there. That right, yeah, right there, that's where it would be. And so it gives opportunity that the middle schoolers would just go right to their spot. They don't even have to kind of congregate through, which uh, I think is, is better. Um, also, the, our clinicians are, they're, they're yellow rooms next to the blue. Having it just be a middle school class gives it less uh, student um, moving in and out because that used to be the support room. So some, when a kid would need support, they'd be coming in and out of there. The, the two smaller red spaces will become two support rooms. And that'll give us the ability to work with students who need support, but not but break it up and, and not have too many students in one spot. That's That's my quick version. And, and the short story, Dave, I think the other take home is that um, with these changes in, in building use, the students in Summit, uh, your, your professional opinion is they would fit within these spaces. Yeah, yeah. So, we, yeah, thank you, Mike. We, yeah. we went through all the spaces, right? And so we, we should have enough space with the current configuration and probably could add a couple um, uh, students. So, so we're, we're good that way. Um, right. Yeah, so thank that's you. not an issue. Any quick questions on Summit before we go to the high school? It's Any definitely not to scale, by the way, just to <laughs> let people know. It's, uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Last but not least is the high school. Um, I'll do this briefly and then introduce Mr. Principal Jones who can talk through some of these pieces. We, we kept some of the specialized programs off because those wouldn't be used as full classrooms. Um, it's a very similar story as the middle school. They have less interior spaces, don't have windows, but they, they, they do have some that would have to be removed. Uh, but looking at the high school classrooms, if you go back to that original slide with those desks, the DESI version versus what we were thinking, here we're at like, you know, roughly 15, sometimes 16 desks in a room, and we use all the spaces now at the, the high school, and our class size is significantly larger. So we sort of end up in the same place that we're in at the middle school, uh, where we can't fit all the students. We could fit you know, potentially more than half, but there's hard to get instructional models that make sense both instructionally, but also actually from public safety, public health perspective, um, that you sort of, you're, you're at half or you're at full and the in-betweens don't really work great, uh, particularly from public health perspective with groups not um, trying to mix. Uh, the high school is working actively on a schedule that would reduce the number of transitions for students, um, but I do not anticipate uh, being able to fit all the students at the high school uh, at the same time. Uh, Gene, I didn't mean to steal your thunder, but is there anything you'd like to talk through as well? Uh, Mike, I think you summed it up very, very well. Good evening. Um, I think if you look at this map that we have uh, presented right now, it shows the majority of the building uh, where you have the library. Uh, we have some classrooms that had uh, not been used for instruction as I'm looking at 114 and 112. Uh, they're very good sized classrooms. We can go one to 15, so we add there. Uh, also on the foreign language uh, wing, we have uh, two extra classrooms there where we can move 
classes that had no windows uh, over to those two, oh, excuse me, four spaces. And of course, on our English wing, we have a extra classroom that we can add there. Uh, matter of fact, it's kind of going up and I can't read, totally read it, but it's the, it's the classroom to your right, if you will. Yep, right there. So that is a extra room. And as I said, closer to the main hallway, uh, we have uh, 114 and 112. Um, if you look at the next map, which is the second and third floor, um, our second floor, we don't lose any rooms whatsoever. Uh, we do have a room that is, it was 221, that is a, a department office. Uh, as well as 331, I'll get to the third floor in a second. But on our second floor, we don't lose any rooms. Uh, we've gone in and measured uh, with desk at six feet apart. We can go to about a one to 15 ratio on the second floor. So uh, that also includes our uh, science classrooms as you go around that L, if you will. And uh, that would be even with the uh, prep stations, with tables, if we had one to 15 or one to uh, 14, we could also put two kids at a table at our lab tables where they'll be kept a corner from each other, which is within uh, CDC regulations. Going over to the third floor, once again, the same number of classrooms that we've always had it's just that uh, we will be at a one to 15 ratio. All the classrooms have windows, of course, uh, good circulation of air. And I really want to uh, commend our custodial staff, Rupert, uh, Don, and uh, Pete, and his team of uh, custodians. I've been up there, the rooms look awesome. They've uh, been cleaning uh, constantly in those areas, as well as other parts of the building. Um, so I feel confident that we'll be ready to go when we do go back into school, but as I said, we'll be doing half of the school and then we can configure where students will be uh, on those days. Perfect. Thank you, Jean. Any uh, questions about high school? Yeah, Mr. Menino. I may have missed something. Did you explain what you're going to do with the students who don't fit into the building? Well, we're going to go uh, half the students uh, on one particular day and half on another particular day. Yeah, so, I think if I could interrupt, Gene, I'm sorry. I think that relates to the next agenda item. So I'm just a little worried about agenda creep. Uh, everything Gene said is true. I think we'll have to think about models, but um, I think the next agenda item gets to uh, what the school committee might recommend in terms of models um, for us to work on. Okay, okay. Sorry, Gene. No, no problem. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Um, also, and this probably, I, might, I don't know if I'm going to be agenda creeping, as you say, uh, about the proposed instructional schedule model that we're looking at, but even still, it'll work well with the physical plan of the building. So uh, I feel good about the physical plan. I feel good that we can put one to 15 safely. And really we're very fortunate that we had extra rooms, that rooms that did not have adequate window space, we could put uh, students and teachers in other rooms. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Principal Jones. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any. Speak up if you're waving and I can't see you. <laughs> no, great. Um, so I think um, just sort of one last call now that I can see everybody. Does anybody have any sort of closing comments or questions? Otherwise, I think so. Sort of take uh, Dr. Morris up on a suggestion that we take a five minute break. Um, uh, quickly, but before we do, are there any questions? Mr. Harrington. I just had a point of order question. Um, so we're over the two and a half hour mark. Do we need, we need to vote to continue? 
Yes, we Can do. Can we do that after the break or? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I believe we have to um, sort of all agree and nod to a five minute break. I don't, do we need to take a vote on the on a break? No. Okay. Um, so uh, is, are people generally in favor of a five minute break? I'm seeing a lot of thumbs up. Okay. We are, we will take a five minute break and re return at uh, 925. And I want to thank the principals because they probably won't be returning from the break on the call. So thank you very much for uh, the administrative team for staying up late and doing this work and, and sharing your thinking about next year. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Um, so uh, with some following up on uh, Mr. Harrington's uh, point of order, I don't know if the if our the Pelham School Committee has such a policy, but in um, Amherst and region, we actually have a policy that um, if we go over two and a half hours, we have to vote to continue um, beyond that. So uh, would somebody like to make said motion? Mr. Demling. I move to continue the Amherst School Committee meeting for an additional half hour. I hear the half hour part. <laughs> I said, Lord, second. Moved by Demling, second by Lord. Um, uh, I'll call out your name. Please indicate your vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. And McDonald, aye. So we will continue. Um, I will make a similar motion for the region school committee that we extend our meeting by 30 minutes. Second. second. Moved by McDonald, second by Stancer. Um, again, roll call vote. Ms. Stancer. Oh, sorry, uh, Ms. Spitzer. <laughs> aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Can't hear you, Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Sullivan. <laughs> Sullivan, aye. Um, and McDonald, aye. So moved. Okay. Does Pelham have a similar? No, so, I really don't know. We've, in my experience, never run up against it. <laughs> It's like not a thing up the hill. Um, <laughs> do you know, Dr. Morris? Do we have no that? policy? <laughs> you're on mute. Yeah, uh, you're good. Okay, all right. Yeah. The chair says it's okay, so it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So um, to introduce this next uh, topic, um, which is our priorities for um, planning um, for fall 2020. Um, this is the document um, that's in your packet that, um, that we emailed was um, uh, a group effort in, in drafting. Um, and I, I just to frame this, this conversation, um, this isn't, as, as we know, we talked about this at the, you know, our very first meeting on this topic of fall 2020, I think it was back in the beginning of June, um, that this is a difficult topic. Um, and as, as we can tell here from sort of the variety of public comment, both from families, um, students and staff, um, it, it's, it's a challenging, um, I keep calling it a Jenga tower. I don't know if that's really an appropriate analogy, but um, so this document is an attempt um, both to, for um, our three committees um, to sort of put down on paper, um, our, our principles, if you will, our guidance, um, both for um, Dr. Morris and the district to um, assist them in planning, but also to help our, our communities to understand what we're thinking about, what it could look like, um, as we've been talking about this for a long time. Some of it might seem obvious to us because we've been deep into all of these meetings and conversations, um, but if you haven't been following as closely 
along, our conversations, they may not be as quite as obvious to others that are less close to it than we are. Um, so it's 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 as much to aid the community in understanding and sort of getting to the same place that we've gotten um, in understanding as well as to guide the district. And it's a difficult balance between sort of, um, as somebody phrased it, like what are our lines in the sand um, that we as um, school committees um, will not accept, you know, will only accept these, these particular things. Um, and what are, and then balancing that with the principles that will will definitely adjust pending changing public health situation, public health guidance from um, experts um, in areas like that, not ours. Um, so this represents, there was a group of us, um, Ms. Hall, Mr. Demling, Ms. Stancer and myself sort of pulled this together um, over the weekend. Um, it is a draft, so I hope, you know, by putting it in all caps and red, that it's clear that this is just our starting point for conversation. Um, if you were able to read it before, but um, as we scroll through it, you'll see some places where we've highlighted points where we couldn't come up um, with an agreement and so wanted to make sure that we were calling that out and having that discussion tonight. Um, so our hope is that we can have this conversation. This will and, and amend this um, as, as needed. Um, and then this can be the basis for um, for discussion with at the town halls with uh, with our communities and staff on Thursday. Um, and then the hope is that we will be able to review a modified updated version next week at our meeting um, and potentially vote on it so that the district knows what our goals are for um, for whatever models we have for um, the fall. So I'm um, that was sorry, my long-winded introduction. Um, Ms. Hall, Mr. Demling, or Ms. Stancer, if you'd like to add anything um, that I may have missed in sort of framing this. No, Ms. I think that was a great intro. Okay. Ms. Stancer? Um, yes, thank, thank you, Allison. I guess I would just stress to anybody out there listening that it, you know, the virus situation is changing all the time and we will be paying attention to what's going on. So please don't be alarmed that we've made up our minds. Um, yep, really good points. Mr. Demling? Yeah, just to piggyback on the point Ms. Dancer made, um, yeah, as I was reviewing this uh, right before the meeting, one, one of the bullets that um, uh, struck me as, as quite central, um, that isn't called out as central is uh, in the on the second page in the in-person learning section, that fifth bullet that says in-person and hybrid learning approaches will include plans for transitions to fully distance learning when the public health situation necessitates school closure or other disruptions to in-person learning. And I thought that was almost a candidate as a, as a top level goal, because what it calls out is this principle that, you know, there's, there's two major unknowns we have that are going to remain unknown until we start school. One is what is the status of the pandemic going to be uh, when we start school and then through the school year? And then how effective is what we've planned both for in-person and remote learning going to be? And then based on that information, we're gonna to have to adjust, right? Like, like we're making tremendous amount of effort right now to make the most educated, thoughtful guesses possible, but that's really what they are. We're, we're trying to predict the future. And, and once we get into late September, October, we'll have so much more actual actualized data to say, oh, well, this is how this ought to be implemented in person, or this is how this ought to be implemented um, uh, online. And, um, you know, I, I heard that theme echoed a lot in, in some of the public comment about um, how if you, if, you took, if you took a survey in June versus August, it might be so much, you know, markedly different. And so we can't always be relying on, on these fixed points of information. So I, I Kind of feel like that that's almost like a at least in my mind a top level goal that like like yes we do need to very soon pick it and stick it so that we give our educators and administrators enough time to implement this responsibly um because i i mean i'm just overwhelmed by the number of operational logistical details they're going to have to be worked out in any model so you know i don't want to endlessly discuss this um but but it, but it is a good point that, that this is this is this is going to be the the starting model, and it's going to have to it's going to have to adjust to conditions on the ground, and 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 with our students as we as we go through the, the school year. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, a really good point. Um, 
So I, I think, you know, we, we started with, we state, started with our overall, as, as Mr. Demling called it, top level goals. Um, and number one on that was protecting staff and student safety. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, we tried to sort of weave that throughout. Um, we have the, the section on staff and student safety, but as Mr. Demling points out, it sort of, it lives within many other bullet points um, under the in-person and distance learning um, discussions. Um, and then I think the other key point is maximizing in-person learning while maintaining our six feet of physical distance and investing in and delivering the highest quality distant learning possible. Um, so we, we have a lot of learnings and guidance on that um, as we heard um, this evening from the distance surveys. D distance learning survey, sorry. <laughs> Ms. Seeger. I have a, probably a more general question, but I think it relates to this. I'm, I, I understand that the that DESE is going to release more guidelines, and I know that initially they want the districts to produce three different plans. Um, what I'm wondering in all our planning and frameworks, et cetera, is um, what they hand out. Uh, there's going to be probably directives in there, and like, you know, how much. I know we talked about this a little bit before, but how much leeway are we going to have? Um, and actually, as I asked this question, I realized it was probably very difficult to answer. Um, but if they say that all of learning is going to be virtual for the fall, like if it's if it's that way, is it that way? You know, there, there's going to be some point where we can't have a variance from it. Um, so I'm sorry, it's an ill-formed question. Um, but how likely do you think it is that that whatever we plan, we're going to be able to do if the state says something different? And, I, and really, I think I'm tired, and that's a terribly framed question. <laughs> um, I understand. Yeah, I, I think um, if I could attempt to re reframe it, I think what you're what you're getting at is. A little bit also what um, Mr. Dumling was alluding to is this idea that this balance of trying to get to something so that the district and team can can really begin to go through all of the minutia of things that they need to tackle between now and the end of August. Um, at the same time, recognizing that things guidance is going to change, whether it comes from DESE um, or from our local public health or from CDC. And so how do we balance that? Um, does that c capture? <laughs> yeah, Dr. Morris? Yeah, on that point, um, it's something I do a lot of thinking about, so I appreciate the question and the comment that Ms. McDonald made. Um, I think for us, you know, it's July 7th. We don't usually meet on July 7th as committees, right? This is itself unusual. Um, and so uh, in none of these models, I want to be really explicit where our thinking is, do we see a fully full day uh, in school model, even at the elementary schools where students would theoretically fit uh, because of all the needs for training of staff and training, um, uh, you know, all the work that we've had and I've been consulting. I want to thank publicly Julie Fetterman, who's the Amherst Health Director, because she's been She's retiring soon, and I'm really sad about that. It's ironically the day before school is supposed to start, which you know um, is sad to me. I'm sure they'll find someone wonderful, but uh, we'd really be looking even at the elementary schools that can have students in full. Uh, you know, that students do fit at six feet. We, we'd likely be looking at a reduced school day. Um, so I don't. We're not looking at any models that I would consider not hybrid, because that is a hybrid model. It might be the beginning or the end of the school day, where there'd be some online instruction. Um, so you know, the short answer is that. For that, um, all students in full time, you know, my answer to that when Desi asks is whatever you vote, if as long as you're staying with six feet, uh, we can't really do that across our districts. Um, so it's really about what hybrid model, and then if we do want to do all remote, but both of those have huge implications, you know, and not to go down too far down the rabbit hole, because um, I think that's not the point of the conversation, but you know, we know that we won't meet all students' needs. There are some students where remote learning doesn't work for in the spring and the emergency situation we're in, we did the best we could, but particularly for students with intensive special needs, students who are beginner English language learners, we know that distance learning doesn't cut it and we'd have to think about other models and 
what do we do to support those students? Because ethically, I don't think we can continue moving in that direction. We may be on a distance learning path because the pandemic hits, right? I'm not talking just about the decision the school committee makes, but I don't see that as a, as a model that we that I feel like we can continue. Um, so I think there's all sorts of kind of variations even within these uh, that makes it particularly particularly challenging. So getting a sense of where the school committee is, and I don't mean tonight, I mean over the course as you get feedback, uh, is going to be really critical, but we are going to have to plan on all the contingencies because of the public health needs and and, and we don't exactly know where the community is on this, except all, not all in the same place. That one we can guarantee. Um, but beyond that, I don't think we can say much more. Um, you know, and so for me, um, understanding perhaps, and I'm not trying to offer feedback on this. Uh, I don't know, is it is it appropriate, Ms. McDonald, Ms. Hall, to offer a little bit of what, what might be helpful for our team uh, in addition to what's already been written? Yes, you please know, do. Yes. It, it might be helpful to know what priorities you have uh, I think there's some in here clearly in this draft, elementary students attendance is prioritized, at least in terms of the quantity of it uh, in person as opposed to secondary, but it might be helpful to do one more gradation. And you know, you do mention special needs in ELL, but if we were in a situation where um, significantly fewer students were able to be in for a whole host of reasons, a health situation, like, you know, to have some more gradation uh, about, you know, if we were able to get, I'm making up a number, like 200 kids in our buildings, because we only could do classes of five, what would be the priorities there? Because um, I think from our vantage point, it's, you know, the more information and more contingencies we can plan for and having that input would be helpful. I don't know how to write that. I know I'm asking you sort of an impossible task, uh, so to speak, but um, I have my thoughts on who those students would be. Um, and, and, but that, those are my thoughts, not yours. But um, I do think something in between what's written and fully distance, um, you know, might be helpful for us to consider so we can plan on on all sorts of contingencies that way. You know, our, our survey feedback multiple times and, and Obed commented on this last time uh, showed that, you know, for instance, students with in more intensive special needs had a particularly hard time with distance learning, which would be a surprise, you know, not a huge surprise because that's true across the country uh, and likely the world. So, you know, again, I don't want to push that part of what I'm saying based on feedback of staff, but uh, staff and students, I should say, and families. But, you know, I just wonder if there's one level of uh, in between what's here and distance learning, uh, that guidance that we could do some thinking about. Um, and doesn't have to be done tonight, but that's just, uh, I think for all the reasons Ms. Seeger said, having sort of understanding what the priorities are, you know, beyond kind of more a more full hybrid model and a more full distance learning. Uh, where that would lie would be helpful information. Sorry, it's long-winded. I'm I'm a little little tired tonight. At this point. I think what might be helpful is if, if folks have had a chance to um, to read this, maybe to just sort of chunk it through, sort of before we dive into the in-person learning, just to sort of clear: Are there any questions or concerns, comments, ads, changes in the staff and student safety section? Ms. Spitzer. Again, I'm also really tired, so I'm going to preface it with this, but I, I want to even back up a little bit to the overall goals. So mm -hmm. we have as goal number two, maximize in-person learning time while maintaining six feet physical distance. And I know that was a really big issue that where we kind of clashed with Desi, but I'm wondering, is, is that the thing to be calling out? Because I think in reality, that's as arbitrary, <laughs> it's somewhat arbitrary, but, and maybe the phrase would be something more like, while maintaining um, an environment or, you know, physical space that is, you know, as safe as possible. I'm not phrasing this right, but it just seems to me like it's not just the six feet of physical distance. It's having hand washing stations in, in the rooms, having bathrooms, all of these things that have gone into that very precise planning that we just watched. It's not just about the, the distance. So, um, that was something I, I, I want to add to that. That's great. Um, yeah. I do have a comment on staff and student safety, but I'm happy to wait and to, if anybody else has comments on the goals piece. I, I personally think that that's a that's a a, a great build on that um, number that goal number two. So um, does do other how do other folks feel? 
Mr. Demling? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I just did want to say a, like a general comment about the 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 inherent conflict between goals one and two that we called out four weeks ago. So when we started this all the first week of June, you know, we, we were very self-conscious and intentional about the fact that unless we are all supporting a model where we all shelter in place until a vaccine's available, any model that we're talking about implementing is, is going to increase um, health risk for both students and staff a non-zero amount. I mean, that's just the, that's just the reality. It's the harsh reality of, of the state of emergency and global pandemic that we're currently existing in. And, and, you know, I we, you know, we said that because of, of the educational value that that in-person learning brings and and the um the educational loss from from uh from not having everyone on site the potentially unrecoverable for a lifetime educational loss not just for everyone but for our youngest and highest need students and so you know i i'm i i we we hear a lot of sincere and through email and through public comment um you know, uh, points of view that are inherently irreconcilable, you know, and, and, the, and, the, and this is going to sound contradictory. I feel are like both valid at the same time. You know, it's like I hold these two contradictions at the same time of, of, of health and, and this really critical need of not wanting generations of students to fall behind irrecoverably for the rest of their lives. And, and so we have to, we have to balance these two things. Um, I think I think that's the, so. When I sort of confuse <laughs> those two concepts that are in conflict, that's where I get the such a strong foundation for pushing back on the state guidance as hard as we have. Like that's why we're like six feet, and I don't know how Mr. Harrington put it, not not an atom less, <laughs> right? Um, and 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 that's why I'm willing to accept like you know we have these like non-ideal disruptions like the fifth and sixth of Crocker Farm. To the middle school it's like why would we consider a model that had these kinds of imbalanced and major disruptions well it's because we are so adamant about trying to thread this needle and to serve both both the, the health and the educational needs of our community at the same time um i don't think there's a beautiful poetic way to call that out <laughs> in the in the goals there um but but i i, I you know but with with the enhancements uh, uh potentially that Ms. spitzer mentioned and on on number two i think i think that's I think that's that that's potentially there, um, but I don't I don't think there's any real way to sugarcoat that these are two really, um, um, really high priority goals that that are not perfectly harmonized, you know, and and so we're we're doing the best we can to 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 take everybody's points of point of view and implement the most effective plan we can. Um, again, I don't think we should stay in the goal. I don't think there's a way to, but I just, I did, I, there's been so much sincere input that we've received. I just did want to call it out. Yeah. It, it does call to question. I wonder, um, is cause it, it this came up in a, in, um, sort of side conversations, um, that this maybe, and it might be that first bullet under staff and student safety you know that we're, we're talking about this in the context of our current situation which is in in our in a in our region which is that we have a low case case count um and and we we're sort of on the down you know on the downswing of of our um region peak we're not florida we're not texas and if we were that situation we wouldn't even be having this conversation right like it would be a totally different conversation and kind of as, as several of you mentioned, it's, it's going to be changing and it will con continue to change. And so, which is probably why Desi has asked for, for three, three separate models, right? Because we're going to have to, you know, be able to move certainly more seamlessly than we did in the spring to um, between different approaches, depending on local health situation. And so I wonder if, if, we should, if there's a way that we strengthen or, or sort of bring that and make that connection more strong um, in, in, that, in that point is that, the, you know, I think in, in Dr. Morris's very first presentation, it was um, step one, step two, or I can't remember the language that the CDC used and, and sort of some way that we acknowledge that these priorities are built on the assumption that we're we we are capable and and you know having in-person learning is feasible from and recommended or 
not recommended, but at least not <laughs> disrecommended based on local pu public health guidance. You know, we're all we're all fading. So um, this this isn't. I'll just I'll just say this isn't the only time that we're going to be talking about this document. So I think right now, um, you know, g given that we're all sort of a little frazzled, um, if we can focus on sort of glaring things or or really um, important topics that we want to make sure that we're talking about several times, um, would be a good a good approach for tonight. Miss Spitzer, you had your hand up. So the other comment that I initially had was just the last bullet on this page under staff and student safety. When we say that we'll make um, accommodations for students who have underlying mental conditions and also similarly for staff, I, I guess I just wanna open up the window about what are we gonna do about the, because of this virus, it's not just the student, it's everybody who comes in contact with that student. And same thing with it's not just the staff member, but it's, I, I don't wanna have to ask a staff member to um, socially distance from their family when they go home or a student to have to socially distance from their loved one or their caregiver. So I, I just think we may wanna think through really carefully how we, um, how we process that. And, and then it gets through like weeding through these accommodations. Like I, I don't know if anybody in the district wants to be tasked with the job of deciding who has a appropriate um, medical condition that requires a, an accommodation. So this just, this, this strikes me as something where we'd want to be a little bit broader in terms of thinking about like the family unit that that person is in but also that we may want to even just think about how we're going to actually implement that. And if it's something that we're actually going to be making decisions on, or if we will just on a, you know, if, if you ask for an accommodation, we will provide you with that accommodation, regardless of the reason. So. Um, Ms. Eager. I don't know if I'm adding on to what Ms. Pizzer was saying, but I, it just makes me think that, um, this may not be quite the right area to mention it, but in thinking about the quality distance learning experience, if if parents had the option throughout the entire, at least fall semester to say, um, I don't want my kid to come into school, but I do want the quality online learning experience, um, you know, should, should something like that be thought through and prioritized, you know, because then you, you de-densify the school a little bit for those families that feel like we really can't have our kids there um, or don't want to have their kids there yet. Um, which is, I'm thinking of the accommodation part, right? So you have accommodations for families who do worry about underlying medical conditions, and then you have accommodations for families who may not be, but are, are still seriously concerned about, about um, having their children back in the school because of having someone at home or just in general. Um, I hope that makes some sense. Mr. Demling. So, so I don't have an, it's a, so it's an excellent point. Um, I don't have an answer to that question. I guess one thing I would need to hear from like the superintendent is, so, so let's take K to six as an example, you know, so the, the model that we're, we're presenting in this paper is, is 80 to hundred um, percent on site um in-person learning so if we have you know say 13 percent or whatever the survey percentage was of parents that say of k to six who say i'd prefer my student to be at home 100 percent it's do do we even have the resource the staffing resource capacity to make that happen like to to me let i'm i'm like let's let's not spend waste time discussing whether we should offer fully remote just, just if you ask for it at K to six, if we don't even have the staffing to be able to deliver on that. Um, so I, you know, that would be re really my first question is in, in these models, how much, how much optionality of, of, of whether my student comes or goes when they are allowed to be on site, uh, can we accommodate? And because there's gotta be a limit, there's gotta be a, a, a tech and a, and, a, and, mo and mostly a staffing limit. And, and, and I, can't, I can't say what that is. And I, I, sort, I wouldn't wanna, you know, have our committee spend hours talking about that and then realize that, well, we actually can't, we actually aren't able to make that happen. Dr. Morris. 
Yeah, so I mean, I think ideally you'd want to match the staff who can't return uh, based on health condition to students who either can't return or don't return, as you as you said. Uh, I know the state is has expressed to us that they're perhaps purchasing and you know districts have the opportunity to pay into some more self-guided curriculum by grade level. They haven't rolled out exactly what that is for families uh, or for students rather. Um, so I can share more information as I hear more. I think our next conference call is Thursday. Um, and um, I, I think, you know, to Ms. Spitzer and to your point, you're right. It's the balance of staff who return versus students return. There, there's a relationship between those two things. Um, and um, I, I don't want to get into the, my personal opinion is some of uh, Ms. Spitzer's point about um, who returns and who doesn't gets into negotiations and, and perhaps should be talked about um, in executive session because that would be something that would be negotiated with our bargaining units. I don't think it was a bad comment to bring up, but I don't, I don't feel comfortable sort of responding because uh, I think the committee would have to weigh that and, and that is something that certainly is part of bargaining um, with all of our units, not just one uh, as it relates, but I do think um, it may, staffing is going to be a challenge and that's why we have reached out to staff and have followed up uh, following the CDC guidance around that um, that piece, and it may be that we need to, you know, scale back some of the what we think we were able to do um, based on you know the staff we have and and how many students the staff choose to return. It's really hard to run two parallel systems, uh, and uh, you know, and be successful at either. Um, and, and I err on the side of perhaps scaling back. This is what gets back to my earlier conversation on, on having clear priorities. If we can't get to 40% at the secondary level and 80 to 100% at elementary uh, and have the emphasis on special ed and ELL that's listed, you know, sort of where is the priority and where would be the decision-making tree if our staffing doesn't accommodate, uh, based on a whole range of factors, uh, getting to that place. Um, so I think that's where, I, I guess, uh, not tonight necessarily, but I'll be looking for guidance from the committee uh, about, you know, what are the things that the committee feels most passionate about in terms of in-person learning, uh, what's next, and, and having some priority, prioritized sense of that would be really helpful for our team because until we get all this information and, and even this conversation of who is exempted from a staff, right, that has large implications, our ability to, to pull anything off. And so um, I do think there's worthy having conversations, certainly having an attorney in an executive session to go through what the committee's options would be would be really helpful, but that's gonna be a critical piece because um, I don't want to overpromise and then come back to you all and say, no, because of X, Y, Z, we're actually not able to achieve this. Um, so sorry to speak a little bit of code, but I do think it's part of a larger negotiation strategy the committee may want to consider. Ms. Seeger? I can appreciate the, the tricky balance that this all is. And I think that um, what Mr. Demling said um, it is a double-edged sword, right? Because if we do minimal or I realize that there's two paths that 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 we're talking about, in-person learning, at least some hybrid model and then distance learning um, and weaving either the two together somehow or, or maybe they're separate. But, but it's a double-edged sword because if we do have a um, second wave for this area, you know, we're going to go all virtual again. And I know that um, it was really tricky in the spring. And I imagine that it would be a lot smoother in the fall because people have a rhythm to it. But I would hate to see like accommodations being having to be thought through at, at the point in time that they're being asked for, if, you know, the, just like it happened in the spring. Um, I imagine it'd be a lot smoother. I know there's a lot of talent in the district and a lot of things have been learned, but that's kind of what I'm thinking of. And we are bringing in students from UMass and we are bringing in students from Amherst College back to the Valley. I don't know what the other colleges are doing, but I know that both of them are um, having people here. So that's some of my thought process in thinking about this. Looking to some, uh, some of the folks that haven't yet um, spoken up, um, if, if do you have any any comments on the discussion? Um, what do we um, do we do we want to dive into some of the the comments about the in person learning? I think just to talk about the structure because it it, it does. You're, um, 
the way we've structured this document, it does sort of suggest that there there is going, you know, just if you just read the the, the headlines or the subheads, it suggests that there's two parallel systems going on, um, and so that may be sort of a a structural improvement we can make on this, because um, I, I think you're absolutely right. When you read, if you read the in-person first and you see that one, we're sort of saying minimum 40% or two days per week, that's not the only learning, obviously, and only instruction that they're going to get. So what, what we're actually saying is that, that that would be a hybrid approach. And so the distance learning is is both and. It's sort of a, you know, a component to the, the middle school, high school instruction, as well as the the alternate plan for um if depending on where where the health situation evolves you know what what we have to sort of default to and move to um uh quickly when changing changing situations so um it's it's kind of a both and as opposed to parallel systems um but I think, you know, building on uh, Dr. Morris's asks for um, at least additional priorities maybe we could at least talk about the ones that we that are currently in this document um do we have the right ones here um the the comment about days per week versus um percentage of school days i i think might be helpful to sort of tackle um at least hear what every what everybody's thinking about these if if we do have comfort you know <laughs> coherent thoughts at, at 10 o'clock at night <laughs> Mr. Dumling. Yeah, I'll just say as briefly as possible. I think the simpler approach for the, this document, inc including for hopefully when we vote it next week, would be to avoid the implementation detail of if it's 40% at the middle school and high school, does that mean two days in week one and two days in week two, or does it mean four days in week one and zero days in week two? To me, that's an implementation detail. It's an important implementation detail, but for me to be able to make an informed call on it, I need to hear info um, and pro cons from the superintendent that we haven't dived into yet. You know, I, I feel like we've glossed over it once um, on a couple meetings ago, um, but I don't feel prepared to to say one way or the other which absolute way we should go. But but I do feel like we're 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 at or or nearly at a point where we we ought to be able to say how many what our minimum days per week are at seven to twelve, and then. Leave that implementation detail for for the following meeting. I think that's that's a just in terms of organizing our efforts uh, and trying to get to a decision point sooner rather than later. I think that would be somewhat effective. Ms. Pitzer. So I just want to I guess I, I I like the the focus on getting elementary kids students in more. If, and not only for the space reasons, but I think also for, for their health reasons and developmental reasons. And, and I do like the, the emphasis on the special education and English language learners. Um, I think one of the things that um, we talk about these transitions, I'm wondering about, you know, for the folks who, I think unfortunately we are gonna have people who are going to have to be out of school for at least 14 days due to COVID either in the family or the individual themselves, either community required, you know, even if we do the best things that we, <laughs> we do in our schools, there are going to be people who are going to be in our community who are going to be in themselves or in family units where they're going to have to stay at a school for at least two weeks. And that may happen at a time when school is happening in person. So I think we we're, they're going to need to get education while they're home for those two weeks as well, um, assuming they're well enough to do so. So I think you know, when the public health situation, so that's the that second to last bullet in the in-person learning. So I think it just might be worth calling out that that's a, that's a situation that we're gonna have to deal with as well, is that it'll be not only like moving from hybrid for the entire school, but also um, moving to distance learning on a case-by-case -case basis as, as things happen. Um, so yeah, I, I think we're moving in the right direction with this. And I think the priorities that are being set uh, um, seem reasonable. Um, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Morris, if I can ask a question, so like just to help, and, and, and it might just be foggy 
<laughs> due to the late hour, but when you talk about wanting sort of the next layer of prioritization, so if we can't get, you know, the, the model that we just saw showed us, you know, for most of our elementary schools, 100% of the students could be in the buildings um, or at least could be accommodated. We, the situation in the middle school and the high school is not the same, that it, it's probably somewhere between, you know, 40 and 60%, but it's not 100%. What sort of, what's, what is that additional detail of prioritization? What does that look like? Because I, I, I personally am having a hard time wrapping my mind around that. <laughs> Maybe because I'm not being clear and it's late and I'm tired. So I want to <laughs> have that caveat uh, to my response. But um, in a scenario by which we had to really significantly reduce the number of students in a building, you know, for instance, you know, and I'm trying to be really, what I, I'm doing what I don't want to do, which is to promote my idea, which is not really my goal. Um, but I can imagine, based on the conversations we've had over the last two months, one might prioritize kindergarten through second grade plus intensive special ed programs plus beginner ELLs, right? You know, and that's a much scaled down version, but it could be the case that we're in uh, a situation where, you know, based on staffing needs, based on a whole variety of factors. Um, so, I mean, I think I can intuit that from the language on here, um, but, you know, in a not worst case scenario, but also not best case scenario, some middle ground scenario, which, which could emerge. Um, I wanna make sure I'm gonna read the committee right on that, um, not as the preferred scenario. Um, so I think that's true based on the conversation, but it's not, you know, explicit um, in the document. And maybe I just, we can live with it not being explicit because, you know, we can have, we, we meet enough, we talk enough and we can work it out if that sort of awkward middle ground scenario emerges where we don't have, we're not Arizona, we're not Florida, we're not Texas, but we're not where Massachusetts is right now. And we really can say really, really limited attendance in school and very small groups is, is something that we're able to do. We don't have to go all distance, but we, we can't really implement uh, as robustly as what is in this document now. Um, and, and maybe that's just something that we deal with in real time as it happens. But I guess, you know, um, there's a big gap between what's in this document and all distance. Um, and so I just wonder if there are gonna be potential moments that happen where we're, we're not quite at the all distance place, but we're like, ooh, really, really small groups of kids. Uh, who are the priority to have in? You know, we're, we're gonna really have class sizes that are are minuscule, but we feel like we can do it. We don't have to totally shut down who would be the people that we would sort of prioritize. But, you know, the more I even talk myself out of putting this in a document, I think I'm good now. Uh, but I think it's just trying to think through all the variations may not be as helpful. So sorry for wasting uh, or spending uh, committee time with my own uh, late night thoughts. No, that, that, was, that was actually helpful. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Whether or not we decide to put it in the document or not, I, I, I now can, um, at least I, I don't know if others felt that way, but that was useful. Thank you. Um, yeah, for, you know, I've seen some, some districts, some countries, you know, have prioritized transition grades as well as, as the early grades. So, you know, the seventh and ninth grade and 12th grade, for example, um, might be sort of like the next tier there. Yeah. Um, I'm, um, I don't want to shut down conversation, but I'm also sensing that we're we're all like really really fading. So I don't know if there's value in in continuing. Um, so I'm just going to sort of pause and let anybody who's like really really anxious to say something. <laughs> I'm being I'm, I'm being bombarded with silence. Um, <laughs> um, Okay, so I um, I think we I've I've, I've taken notes. Um, I don't I don't know. Is it is it okay for you know if there's additional like questions or thoughts for committee members to email just me? Is that sort of acceptable? Okay, I'm seeing a nod, head nodding. So. Um, if anybody has any thoughts, sort of that you don't want to wait until next Tuesday. Um, when we meet again, um, you know, feel free to 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 shoot me an email, and I'll keep track of all of that so that 
um, you don't have to remember a week from now what, what you're thinking um, immediately on this document. Um, there's also in our packet was the um, the staff um, guiding the the guiding principles that the various staff and administration um, committees have pulled together. Um, I don't know um, if if we were. I, I, I'm going to say let's let's weave that into our discussion next week um, so that we can uh, keep moving. <laughs> um, and then, uh, so the next the next portion is is planning for our future meetings. So as mentioned, we'll, we'll come back to this um, priorities document um, next week. Um, and between now and then, um, this uh, we are having our town halls on Thursday, um, where where communities and community members, staff, family, students um, may join and. Um, hear about these priorities that uh, this draft um, as well as um, answer questions or ask questions and um, and hear those updates on and provide us additional uh, feedback and comment and even just this evening I've, I've seen emails coming in saying will we have another opportunity to provide comment so if anybody's at home is still watching and listening to us <laughs> at 10 10 um, yes uh, short answer is um, several opportunities on Thursday um, at 12 o'clock for elementary and 5 p.m. for secondary. And then of course, um, uh, anytime um, by 3 p.m. next week, um, we'll also have public comment at our meeting next week. Um, for most of you, many of you were on the, the, before we started the meeting, but I just wanted to like talk about the, um, the, the town halls. Right now, the committee chairs and vice chairs will be on screen um, during the town halls. Um, we but we have a cap, but we of who can be on screen. But it is a posted public meeting, so any of us um, who would like to to view, comment, ask questions during during the town hall, you are welcome to um, because it is a posted public meeting. Um, and if you're not able to because of work commitments or or other family commitments, um, of course that's also um, uh, it's not a required um, <laughs> a meeting. Dr. Morris? And it just the same YouTube link that's been advertised, it's a public event and it, it's immediately available for viewing for people who don't, you know, whether for the committee members or the public, uh, right afterwards, it'll always be accessible at that YouTube link that's advertised. So it automatically records. Uh, Amherst Media has asked us if we can record it, they may try to show it on channel 15 as well. So thanks again, props to a long night for faith in Amherst Media, um, but I wanna uh, thank them for reaching out to me about that. It was in that order, not the other way around. Uh, but it, it will be accessible at that link directly following the meeting for anyone to view. Okay. Any questions on the town halls? Seeing none. Um, I believe we have, yes. Um, the warrant report is our is our next agenda. I'm, I don't know if we have any warrants to report. Ms. Spitzer? We have quite a few, so um, bear with me. Um, I've got at least, I think, seven. OK. Um, I, Carrie Spitzer, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $339,407.16 for a warrant dated on June 24th, 2020. Um, it was all for payroll. And I just signed that today, July 7th. Um, I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $781,277.10 for a warrant dated June 24th, 2020. And this was again, um, for payroll and that was signed today. I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $408,624.64 for the warrant dated June 22nd, 2020. And this was for general fund expenses in that amount um, and was signed today, July 7th. 
I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $631,692.28 for a warrant dated June 10th, 2020. And this was all for general fund expenses. And I signed this back on June 16th. I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $602,092.12 for a warrant dated June 6th, sorry, June 16th, 2020. And this was for general fund expenses in the amount of $580,575.10, revolving fund expenses of $8,004,000. $8,457.64, grant fund expenses of $12,624.52, and other funds in the amount of $434.86 no, $434 for a middle school gift. And that was signed back on June 25th. And this one was, um, I authorized annual scholarship payments in the amount of $3,800 on June 16th. And I on also authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $765,089.24 for a warrant dated June 10th. Um, and this was again all for payroll and signed on June 16th. And that is it. <laughs> Sorry. Um. And just reporting for the Amherst School Committee, I don't have any today, but I will have some um, next week because the, the warrants that I had, um, I re received at the end of the day. So um, moving on to gifts, we have one gift. Uh, I'll make the motion since I'm st still unmuted. Um, I move to accept the following gift. Um, from Dean's Beans Organic Coffee Company, number 13544, to support district school meals program in the amount of $2,000 um, for a total gift of $2,000. Second. Moved by McDonald's, second by uh, Spitzer. Dr. Morris, you're muted. It's the third gift we've received from Dean's Beans. Uh, Charitable Foundation on the same topic, and they reached out to us and just uh, reaffirmed their commitment to supporting families in need with uh, food scarcity issues. So I would want to publicly thank them. I know you've had a lot of meetings and uh, things go by really quickly, but I just really do want to acknowledge um, that they continue to come back to us un unsolicited with gifts on this domain, which I think is pretty remarkable. It's a local company, and I just want to say that out loud. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we, uh, we'll move to a vote, and this is a region gift, so the region will be um, voting. Uh, Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Mr. Menino? Menino, aye. Ms. Seeger? Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Ms. Dancer? Ms. Chancellor, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. Uh, so that passes nine to zero. Are there any other motions? Maybe from the uh, uh, Amherst Committee. <laughs> and move to adjourn. <laughs> move by Spitzer, second by Harrington. There's no discussion. Um, Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Sorry, Lord, aye. And McDonald, aye. Uh, the Amherst School Committee is adjourned. Um, Ms. Hall, would you like to? All right, Helen, make it happen. <laughs> I move we adjourn the Pelham School Committee meeting. <laughs> I second. Great. Moved by Kenny, seconded by Menino. Roll call vote. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Kenny. Aye. Kenny. <laughs> Ms. Dancer. Ms. Dancer, aye. And Hall, aye. Good night, everybody.
Good night. And now is there a motion for the Region Committee? I move to adjourn the Amherst Palm Region School Committee. Second. Moved by Demling, second by Lord. No discussion. Mr. Uh, Mr. Demling. Uh, or Mr. Uh, Harrington, sorry. Mr. Harrington seconded. <laughs> Mr. Demling. Aye, Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. Um, the region is now adjourned.